What is your most disturbing, scary, or creepy real story? For more such content, please like and subscribe our channel Thread Tonic. Part 1. Account 1. A few years ago, I was walking through the woods off the beaten track a bit, and I smelt this really overpowering sweet smell, being nosy. I pulled back the undergrowth to have a look and found a dead body. The guy had clearly been there a while and wasn't looking great, all swollen and green and black with various runny bits. The local wildlife had also been dining well for a few days. I called the police, who told me to wait with the body until they arrived, being in the middle of no, where it took a while for them to arrive and it got dark, and I was just sat there in the dark with him for a long time. It turned out he had committed suicide. For a long time afterwards, I had dreams about him, and he would talk to me and not nice things mainly about how he was angry I had disturbed his resting place and he wanted me to kill myself, probably just my imagination, but all pretty disturbing at the time. He still turns up in my dreams from time to time, and no doubt will be tonight after typing this. Account 2. I used to do suicide and murder cleanup. The thing that gets you about it is the smell. It's not that it's that bad, it's just that it's not as revolting as you would expect. That makes it worse that sickly sweet aroma of dead human. Account 3. About two years ago, I was driving home from a family reunion pretty late at night, and the drive was about two hours. I didn't stay the night because I had to be back for work the following day. Most of the drive was on roads with dense bushes and trees on either side. The real creepy ones you see a lot in movies. Anyway, I had been driving about 45 minutes and I was starting to get really tired. You know how sometimes you just suddenly become really tired, out of nowhere? Well, yeah, that happened to me. I knew I wasn't going to last, but I didn't come across any place that I felt I could park and safely sleep. Anyway, after it became clear to me that I wasn't going to find a place to pull up, and my tiredness wasn't going away, I did something very questionable. I pulled over to the side of the road onto the grass, behind some bushes, to try and hide my car from anybody else who was going to come past. The roads weren't empty. I came across another car every few minutes or so. I made a mental note that the time was 11.22 and then fell asleep. Some time later, I was awoken by a scratching sound. I looked at the clock, 11.50. The sound stopped after a few seconds, and because I was still extremely tired, I didn't bother looking around and simply went back to sleep. I was later awoken by the same sound, and it was now 1240. This time it really freaked me out because the sound didn't stop. The thought ran across my mind that it was just an animal inspecting the car, but why would it return almost an hour after it had left the previous time? I looked in my rearview mirror and just managed to catch a glimpse of something running away into the forest. Now, at the time, I thought it was the damn hook killer. You know the one that scratched that couple's car and then slaughtered the guy when he got out to investigate? Fuck that, I thought to myself. So I got the hell out of there. There was a bend no more than a hundred yards up the road, and as I came around it, there was a fucking car. Parked off to the side of the road with the driver's side door opened, I slowed down just to look to see if anyone was in there. There wasn't. Then I looked in my rear-view mirror. I didn't see anything. And all of a sudden... This guy comes sprinting around the corner. He starts screaming at me, shouting stuff like, Hey! Hey, you! Get the fuck out of your car! Now I noted the fuck out of there and sped off. I never saw the guy again. Moral of the story, don't fucking sleep on the side of a deserted road. Account 4. A few summers ago, I went for a bike ride around midnight with a friend. We went our separate ways at the end of the evening, and I had about two blocks to ride back by myself. Because of construction, I had to ride on the sidewalk, but the streets were dead. But it wasn't a problem until right where I was about to turn left onto my street. There was this man walking by himself, maybe 40s, a little scruffy but not homeless. The sidewalk was narrow, and I didn't want to freak him out. So when I got about six feet behind him, I said, Hey, behind you! and he turned around and gave me this super angry look. I turned down me street, and he started to follow me. 
literally screaming about how I was a fucking cunt and he was going to kill me and all that. I live right off the corner and I didn't want him to figure that out. So I decided to do another loop around the block. That's not the scary part. The scary part is that when I looped back around and looked down the street, I saw him standing on my fucking front stoop, staring out at the street like the motherfucker knew I lived there. He saw me ride by again, but he didn't say anything. I ended up going back to the friends, but my bike got stolen from the alleyway by the house two days later. Edit. The guy in question was definitely not actually homeless. We have a large population of mentally ill in that area, unfortunately. Downtown of a medium-sized city, so if I didn't think the sidewalk was too narrow to pass, otherwise I wouldn't have disturbed him. Half the scary part was that he looked pretty much completely normal for my area. That being said, I ended up texting my mom, and she made the decision not to notify law enforcement until my bike was stolen. Count five. This isn't very interesting. But I woke up with blood gushing down my cheek when I was younger, and I didn't feel anything. But my face felt wet. So I went down to my parents' room, and they freaked out. Till, this day we still have not clue what cut my face. But I needed eight stitches next to my eye. We checked the sheets, pillow, pillowcases, edges of the bed, etc. Still no idea. Account 6. My house sits farther back in the lot than most other houses. It is a strange layout as well. The sidewalk runs the length of the living room and ends at the front porch, which lets into the living room. Large windows that do not open allow great light to get into the living room, but at the cost of no privacy, the rest of my family was on vacation and having the house to myself, I decided I would get smashed. Well, I pass out on the couch in the living room at about nine, when I realized I was too scared to walk back to my room. The couch is right underneath these big windows. I woke up suddenly, not knowing why. I had a severe case of the chills, and I could not figure out why. Then the banging started. It came from right above me. I did not move, but I opened my eyes and looked up at the window. Someone was standing there, pounding on the glass. Without moving, I looked at the cable box. It was around three in the morning. The banging continues. Then it stopped suddenly, but I still did not move. Again, coming from two different directions now. Someone is banging on the window and another person is banging on the front door. They kept doing it, would not go away. Finally, after about 40 minutes, they quit. It was the most terrifying event I can recall at the moment. It made me a nervous wreck after that. I called a friend the next day to see if he would come over and stay for the rest of the week, and his response was, what the fuck for? So that we can both be murdered in our sleep. Thanks a lot, asshole. Account 7. I was 17 and had just gotten my license. Back in high school, my friends and I had made it a mission to find abandoned houses to throw parties in. We had a few good candidates, but the mother load was this house I would pass on my home from work. It was an undeveloped shell of a huge home with a large property in the back. I had told one of my friends about it, and one day before we went to see a movie, I took him to the house. It was about dusk in summer, so I had my headlights on, I pulled into the front of the house and we were there for like 10 seconds tops before we pulled back to go to the main road. A minute later, this big truck pulls up behind us with its high beams on and riding our ass. My friend and I took note of it, but paid it no mind as we headed back to the main road. At the light, I turned right, but the truck cut through the gas station at the corner and blocked us off. Out of the truck comes this big hulk of a man, and my friend and I are shitting our pants. He raps on the window, and I roll it down. Now the really freaky part is that this a busy road, and now there was no one in sight. He asks us what we were doing at the house, and I quickly lied and said we were making a U-turn. He stares at us for a few seconds, smiles, and sends us on our way. To this day... The house remains unfinished, and I'm convinced it's a drug operation of some sort. TLDR, don't go into abandoned houses, man. Account 8. When I was about 10, all of my cousins and siblings were over. About 10 of us there. The parents and grandparents were out for an adult dinner. So it was just the kids sitting around watching a few movies, when all of a sudden the house shook, 
and there was a large flash coming from the backyard. It felt as if a bomb dropped. We all heard, felt, and saw it. And as a pack, we ran into the hallway. The eldest cousins in the group debated on calling the police, but opted to call the parents. After a few minutes, we gained our courage and ventured out into the living room again, this time with weapons, just in case. After a half hour with no other issues, the parents came home and thought we were insane. There was nothing wrong with the backyard, and no neighbors reported anything. It's been ten years, and we still talk about it, trying to figure out what it was. That has been the scariest thing to happen to me by far. Count nine. I once sat across from a guy who told me about killing his girlfriend, him cutting her into pieces and boiling her head. He explained why he killed her and wished he could talk to the parents so they could understand that what he did was a good thing. It wasn't. I sat with him for 45 minutes. As he went into detail, was the most surreal 45 minute of my life, source. Worked in Max Security Mental Health Facility. Account 10. Okay, so this happened to me last summer when I was back at my parents' house during the holidays. It was around 3 a.m., and I was in my room on my computer when I got a call from my sister. Now, that was already a little bit weird since my sister's room is just down the hallway from mine, and she could have just came in my room. I went to pick up, and the call ended as soon as I reached the phone. I figured that she wanted to speak with me, so I got up and went to her room. As soon as I reached her door... She started screaming that someone was in the room with her, so I busted in, and of course nobody was here. After she stopped crying, she told me that she woke up and saw a dark shadow just centimeters from her face, and that's when she screamed. So I told her that she called me. She tell me that her phone is not in her room and that she was sleeping. Sure enough, her phone is actually downstairs in her purse. The weird part is that I have the log of her call on my phone, but she doesn't. Never managed to explain this one. Account 11. I was delivering a hot tub to this contractor, realtor, in this fancy gated community near Branson, M.O. When I arrived, the construction workers were in charge of telling me where the thing was supposed to go. It was going on the fourth floor balcony, but because of the way the house was built, the fourth floor was ground floor. The other three floors were on the side of a hill, but the driveway was even with the first fourth floor entrance, if that makes sense. So, a lot of construction going on, but to get the hot tub on the balcony, I had to make a ramp, take it from the drive, down into the yard, up a ramp to the porch, through the living room door, across the living room, out the back patio doors onto the deck. Problem with this was, the deck was unfinished. A huge section of decking was missing. They had literally installed only enough decking so that I could go from the patio doors to the far corner of the deck where the hot tub would sit. There was no railing. The hot tub weighed 900 pounds, and it was a four-story drop if I fell. The construction workers volunteered to help me. We got it out onto the deck, crossed the narrow bridge of installed decking to the corner, and I was about to lay it down. You move these on a dolly while the hot tub is on its edge for clarification. Laying it down isn't that hard. You tilt it. Bring it down to your lap, grab the strap securing it to the dolly and lower it to the deck. It's very controlled, and I'd done it thousands of times. However, this deck wasn't finished, so the contractor wanted to leave it on its edge. It's a lot harder to take it off when it's standing up, because the dolly is under a 900-pound tub. But I've done it before. I told them that we would have to put blocks under one side of the dolly, tilt the tub, and pop the straps to release the dolly so it could be removed from the area. Then you tilt the hot tub back, remove the blocks, and then set the hot tub down on the deck. Problem. The deck wasn't wide enough to allow me to do this safely. I popped the strap on the hot tub, put the blocks under, and I tilted the hot tub. But that put me with my feet four inches from the edge of the deck, with nothing but four stories of air behind me. We were able to free the dolly on one side, but not the other. The hot tub had to be leaned over further toward me. I tell everyone to freeze, and they do. I didn't want anyone messing with it because I had to shift my feet back five inches so my heels were off the deck. I'm freaking out, but it's all going smooth. I have a construction worker on each side of me helping support the tub, three construction workers freeing the dolly, and one useless worker playing with the strap that is going to secure the tub to the house so that the wind doesn't blow the tub over. 
We are inches from having the dolly freed when one of the construction workers freeing the dolly gets impatient and kicks the corner of the tub to dislodge it from the dolly. It works for him, but unfortunately for me, I didn't have my feet set yet. I shout that I'm falling. The two guys beside me take the weight of the tub, but no one can get to me. My arms are windmilling. I'm bent almost double backwards, trying my darndest to stay on the deck. I can see the boulders down below out of the corner of my eye. I'm falling, and there isn't anything I can do about it. I feel myself go. I'm falling. My heels slip out from under me, and no one can reach me. But then suddenly, I'm flying forward. Something is under the small of my back, and it's slamming me into the bottom of the tub. The dolly is removed, and the tub stood up with me hugging it before I find out what saved me. The useless guy playing with the strap had already secured one end to the house. When I fell, the strap was already behind me, hanging off the deck. The construction worker pulled it tight with all his might arresting my fall. It wasn't there for that purpose, but he saved my life that day. I would have been dead if not for him. I thanked him by sending him and his wife and kid to Breckenridge, Colorado for Christmas. It was actually a vacation I'd saved for and was about to surprise my wife and daughter with, but I felt he deserved it more. Plus, my wife and daughter didn't know anything about it. Yeah, that was one of my most scariest moments ever. TLDR, fell off a fourth floor deck, but construction worker saved me at the last moment, so I rewarded him with a vacation to Breckenridge, Colorado. Account 12. This is not supernatural creepy, but is one of the more disturbing and surreal experiences of my life. One early morning, a few short years ago, I'm walking to my bus stop and eating a banana. It is dark, misty, around 5 a.m., and I am internally debating something trivial, like if I want my daily Starbucks before or after the commute. As I approach the dimly lit corner on my street, a tall man in a black mask steps out of the dark alleyway to my left, sleepy and disoriented, I barely acknowledge him. When he shouts, put down your fucking purse and points his gun to my head, things start to click, the man says. Put down your bags, and I tell him, okay, okay, I'm putting them down over here. He orders me to walk over to him, toward the alley, and get down on the fucking ground. And I agree. I'm coming, okay, okay. My heart is beating a million miles a minute, and my hands still smell sticky with banana. I know I need to get away. I don't know why, but my mouth won't stop working. Look, see, I'm on the ground. My stuff is over there. Please just take my stuff, but he doesn't like it. Shut the fuck up, okay? He gets on top of me and puts the gun to my head. At this point, I should mention the fact that I'm on my way to coach a high school practice and I'm dressed like a dude. Huge baggy pants, hat, yacket. If, not for my tell, tail voice, I'd look like a prepubescent 90s rap star anyway. As the guy gets on top of me, gun to my head, he looks at me and pauses. I can't tell you why I know this, but I swear that at this moment, it clicks for him that I'm a woman. He gets off of me, stands up, and points to the dark alley. Come with me. My stomach hurts. I remember that there have been a recent rash of sexual assaults in my neighborhood. During the daytime, no less, when the man points down that dirty alleyway, my internal voice speaks the fuck up, says voice one. There was no way in hell you were going to go down there without a fight. But he has a gun, you dipshit, replies voice. Two, fucking follow me, the real voice. His voice hollers. So I do what I do best, I talk. I'm coming, I'm following you, I call. And the man makes a crucial mistake. He believes me, I take one, two tiny steps backwards toward the sidewalk, and he turns his body and his gun toward the alley. This is my moment. I take a deep breath, tuck my head down in case he starts shooting, and start sprinting away. I hear a voice screaming in a high-pitched wail before I realize that it's mine. After running six or seven blocks, I head back to my apartment, hoping he's not there to see where I lived. The police check out the alleyway an hour later, but the potential attacker is long gone. The only evidence of the encounter is my banana peel browning in the alleyway and the adrenaline rush that I couldn't shake for days. I would be lying if I said that, if that experience doesn't bother me still, but I'm so fortunate to mainly be haunted by the what-ifs and not the 
What dids? Count 13. My grandmother swore by this story till her dying day. It was during the war in London, and my dad was a baby. She was bombed out of her house and was staying with a friend. The friend had set her up in a room on the top floor. Anyway, she was taking my dad upstairs to bed when a figure materialized on the stairs telling her not to sleep in that room tonight. She noped back downstairs and told her friend that she and my dad were sleeping in the sitting room that night. Her friend was annoyed but agreed. That night, a bomb exploded near the house and the roof caved in right on top of my dad's cot. He would have been killed. Part 2. Count 1. So I was sleeping, and in the middle of the dream, a character of my dream who was doing something turned her head, looked at me very seriously, and said, There's someone in your apartment, wake up. I nearly had a goddamned heart attack, and my apartment was empty. Account 2. When I was taking a three-hour trip with my ex to her hometown, it was about 1 a.m., and I started to get very drowsy. The ex had fallen asleep beside me, and I started to drift off. Next things I remember is a hand gripping my head and forcing it towards my ex. And she was looking at me dead serious, saying, Wake up. I woke up with a start, only to realize I had drifted into the oncoming lane towards the shoulder and was going roughly 160 kilometers to her poach. I swerved back into my lane and instinctively hit the brakes to slow down. This woke up my ex, who asked what happened. I claimed a deer had ran in front of the car. I never told her or anyone that I almost killed the both of us out of stupidity. Account 3. I had awesome parents who let me sleep in the living room on weekend nights when I was very young because my sister was a light sleeper and I could stay up until dawn. But of course I always end up sleeping on the couch because Nick at Nighter made me tried. So, one night I wake up to the prickly feeling like an instinct just bolted into a sitting position and stared out the front window. We lived in rural Georgia, so you can imagine the magnitude of trees. In perfect light cast from the moon, I see a silhouette of someone in this fucking tree. The family dog dashes to the window and is snarling into the glass. Terrified, I run into my parents' room and try to explain to my parents that there is a strange person outside. Dad grabs something defensive and darts outside with the dogs to beat the wax off the hothead. I tremble in Mama's arms until Dad comes home and says he saw no one, and to go to bed, I decide to sleep in my regular bedroom. I fill in my sister in as to what happened. Dad is making regular rounds in the house with a cup of coffee. We're all still, and I finally think, I can sleep, nope. I notice the man outside my window. From what I can see in the moonlight, he gives me a shush signal and runs away. Just turns around to run a straight line away. I swear I couldn't stop crying for what felt like hours. Account 4. A week after gaining my CPR certification, I had to try and perform CPR on a woman dying of a heroin. Probably other drugs too. Overdose. I was at a thrift store with some friends looking for Halloween costumes and someone came in saying that someone was passed out in the parking lot. I was in the dressing room, and it just got super quiet. So I came out and told them I was certified and I'd go take a look, and that they needed to call 911. I go outside and don't see anyone on the ground. Someone comes out and shouts that the person is in the car that's parked far out by itself. I ran over and honestly freaked the fuck out. She was pretty much already dead, completely blue in the face slumped against her car window. She had the red druggy rings around her eyes, but those were blue too because she was so oxygen deprived. We opened the door, and I'll never forget that. When we turned her head to see if she still had a pulse, she had tears running down her face. We pulled her out of the car, put her on the ground, and took her pulse again because the first person to do it wasn't sure. We started CPR, and the ambulance arrived about a minute after. They got her strapped up and in, and continued CPR. They had another ambulance come, and those EMTs got out, and there was literally like six of them surrounding her. The cop told us they had administered some type of drug that can apparently reverse heroin overdoses if given in time, but she was pretty much dead already. They would do the necessary stuff until they could get to the hospital, and call it, according to him. I also remember when we opened the door... There was heroin needles and empty pill bottles all over the floor. She wasn't very old, 
We also think she had kids. She had some toys and a car seat, plus two names tattooed on her. Edit. Wow. Thank you guys so much for the responses and the gold. It was definitely a rough situation. But for being 19 at the time, I think I handled it well. Account 5. In 2004, I was a young, dumb, 17-year-old country girl in the city. For the first time for college, one night I decided I could totally safely walk back to my dorm at around 1.30 in the morning, despite not really knowing where I was. Of course, I instantly end up wandering around a terrible part of the city. Most of the streetlights are busted out. Trash everywhere. Loud arguments from inside the dilapidated-as-fuck row houses. In short, I wouldn't even want to be here in the middle of the day. A car drives up behind me and slows down, so they're keeping pace with me for nearly an entire block. I look over, and there are five unsavory-looking men inside. By this point, I was approaching an intersection and they pull up, make a left, and stop in the street directly in my path. Motherfuck, completely panic at this point and just stand there, right in front of them, my mind went completely blank. I've never been that scared in my life. It didn't even make sense to try to run because they would have caught me without question. I'm not really sure how long I stood there. But suddenly the porch light in the house just past the car came on. Dude casually strolls outside carrying a bag of trash and car peels away. I completely break down crying and shaking. Dude spots me and listens to my probably incoherent story. Takes me inside and gives me a soda. Then he and his roommate walked me back to my dorm. They were both lovely and invited me to check out their stand up sometime, but unfortunately I was too young to get into a bar. I never saw them again, don't even remember their names, but feel pretty confident that if that guy hadn't decided to take his trash out at 1 a.m. on a Saturday, my life would have taken a really shitty turn that night. Edit. I completely accept that this was totally my fault and a horribly dumb thing to do. I was extremely fortunate and am no longer that stupid. TLDR, almost abducted by five guys in a super shady part of town really late one night, saved by hero comedian. Account 6. My mother told me this not too long ago, but it happened about 10 years ago now, when my cousin was 17, 18 years old. She was in a car crash and had died a couple of weeks later in hospital. She was really close to my dad's sister, our aunt, and used to babysit her kids who were no more older than four years old all the time. Our aunt's house was under construction just before she passed away, and it continued on after she passed away. One day my aunt got a phone call while she was at work from one of the construction workers complaining about a teenage girl who keeps showing up at the house and walking around, and that she shows up a number of times during the weeks, and it has been happening for a couple of weeks. My aunt asks for a description of the girl to see if she knows her from around the neighborhood. And sure enough, the description perfectly matches my cousin who died a few weeks before. Long brown hair, red baseball cap, denim dungarees, and a white jacket. When my aunt got home, she showed them a picture of my cousin, and that all agreed that it was the girl they seen walking around the site. This story really freaked me out when I heard it, because our family was never one to believe in anything paranormal or have anything of the paranormal sort happen to them before. Account 7. When I was in high school, I had a really good friend who lived next door to a house that was always up for sale. People would move out in the middle of the night without a word, and it hadn't had the same owner for more than six months straight for a couple of years. One night we were really bored, and he suggested we go explore the house next door since it had sat empty for a while. We go around back, and there's a dog door that he can crawl through, and he unlocks the door and lets me in. The house itself is really unremarkable. It looked like it was built in maybe the 1950s and was a craftsman-style house in an older, nicer part of town. My friend's house was similarly built. The kitchen had a really nice built-in breakfast table set against a picture window. The house's electricity was off, but you could see the street light through the window. My friend and I sit down on the floor across from this table and are just hanging out, talking. Why? Who knows? All of a sudden, my friend screams, and in that instant, my vision goes black. 
but it wasn't that I just couldn't see. My body was engulfed in this sickly coldness from head to toe. I start screaming, and I feel my friend's hand grabbing mine and pulling me in some direction forcefully. My vision slowly comes back, and I start to warm up when I realize that we're outside under the streetlight. It was December and should have been much warmer inside of that house. Finally, I look at my friend and he looks scared. I'm really confused and kind of panicked myself and finally ask him what happened. He says that as I was talking, a black thing, this figure that was all black and only had the vague shape of a girl crawled out from under the table and sat on top of me. Apparently I started groping around with my eyes wide open like I couldn't see, and he was so freaked out he pulled me out of the house. We're still friends and we bring it up every now and then, but the story itself never changes and it still sends chills down my spine. To this day, I've never felt such blackness or coldness in my life. It was palpable, almost sticky. For a couple of days afterward, I couldn't shake this unsettling feeling, and I could never walk past that house again. Ugh, I'm scared to get out of bed now. Account 8. Not me, but my sister. So growing up, my sister had an imaginary friend. She said she was an older lady, and she was nice and her name was E.E. E. She talked to her and played with her all that jazz until she was probably four or so, and then it stopped. Fast forward to when my sister was about ten. My mom isn't home. She got a call to go to the nursing home for GPA, so she bolts with pops. My sister and I shared a room at the time, and she was in there doing whatever, and I was on the other end of the house. All of a sudden, I hear the radio in our room click on, turn all the way up, turn all the way down, and go off. This happened like three times. So I go in there to be all like WTF kid, knock it off, and she is sitting in our room, just white as a ghost. I go over to the radio to unplug it. No plug. No batteries. Only radio in the house. I look at her, and she goes, It was E.E. -E. I saw her. It was E.E. -E. So I call mom freaking out, and mom is so upset. Apparently, grandpa had just passed away. Okay, weird. I drop incident, whatever. A few days later at the funeral, a relative comes up to us and gives us a pic she found. My sister goes, hey, it is E.E. -E. It was a pictures of my grandparents when they got married. My grandmother died before I was even thought of. When my mom was 11, we live in the home my mom grew up in. We have no pictures of her at all as my step. Grandmother got rid of them all when she moved into the house a few years after mom's mom's death. Account 9. I may have posted this before, but I don't remember. I was in high school, doing homework at the dining room table. From there, I could see the front door, our front door at the time, had a 2 ets x 5 ish pane of glass in it, with a lace dot curtain over it. I remember hearing a noise, like somebody was on the porch. It was probably 9 p.m. or so. It was very dark outside and the porch light wasn't on. As I'm watching the front door, I can see the screen door opening. It stands open for a minute or so and there's nobody there. Or they were dressed all in black. I'm frozen, waiting to see what happens next. The screen door just slowly closes. If someone was there, they didn't just let it go. Someone was closing it carefully so that it wouldn't make noise. After that, I don't remember if I heard footsteps. Maybe they saw me watching them and decided to quietly get out of there. Account 10. Woke up. Clock says 3.34 a.m. I'm 17, and in my bedroom it's pitch black, but I hear some rattling downstairs. Terrified. I quietly tiptoe to my parents. Room. Weird, it's empty. Where are my parents at 3.34 a.m.? Go upstairs to my brother's room. He's usually awake all night. But while the light is on, no one is in the room. So I guess whatever those noises are downstairs, it must be them. Why are they awake? Maybe someone died. I go downstairs. In the middle of my living room is what looks like two men stealing our TV. No one else is in sight. I run upstairs as quietly as possible, shut and lock my door. Suddenly there's banging on the door. I wake up. It was a dream and the relief washes over me. I look over at the clock. Weird coincidence. It's 3.34 a.m. I'm shaking. 
but decide to go downstairs to prove to myself that everything's fine. I go downstairs. The two men are in my kitchen, screaming at my parents and brother. I run upstairs to my bedroom and lock the door. Ten seconds later, I hear banging. I woke up. It's 3.34 a.m. This time I had actually woken up and I don't manage to fall back asleep for about 36 hours. Edit. Lots of responses about lucid dreaming here. I spent most of my teens and early 20s as a lucid dreamer, discovering the techniques after a childhood plagued by very frightening sleep paralysis. I found a message board back in 1998 where I learned to at least have fun with it. The above story wasn't a sleep paralysis experience, but it was typical of the kinds of nightmares I used to have. Weirdly enough, I rarely have nested dreams anymore and haven't had a successful attempt at lucid dreaming in a few years. My guess is that it has something to do with hormones. Account 11. Wake up in the middle of the night during my university days. It's still dark and roommates are asleep. I sit down to read but then suddenly shoot up from the sofa like a rocket. Wake up again. It's a bit lighter out. Think. Wow, what a weird dream. Go outside to stretch then proceed to shoot up into the sky like a rocket. Wake up finally. Walk into the living room. Carpet is red, think. Wow, that's weird. Shoot up like a rocket, get stuck in roof. Wake up. It's actually morning. Go into the kitchen. And my roommate is preparing herself some breakfast. I tell her about the dreams and she laughs and says something like, Yeah, dreams are just nuts. Start to prepare my day. I have some breakfast then. Go to brush my teeth. As I am brushing my teeth, this huge fucking red demon steps into the bathroom and opens his gaping maw with rows of shark, like incisors, and screams at me. Deafening me, I fall over backwards, yelling for my roommate to run or to help me or something. I notice her legs behind the monster, and she seems to be standing there yelling my name and asking, What's wrong? Oh my God, what's wrong? At this point, I was so convinced I was awake, I thought I had gone completely nuts. The alien, still screaming, reaches a massive red hand towards me. I wake up. To this day, I never know if I am truly awake. Count 12. When I was 13, my grandmother was dying of cancer, and my mother and I stayed at her house and took care of her during her last few weeks. One night at three or so in the morning, my mother ran into my room and told me that my grandmother, who was by this time completely bedridden, entered my mother's room, woke her up, and then walked out of the room. There was no creepiness at the time, just a genuine concern for what my grandmother could possibly be doing up at 3 a.m. when she was literally days away from dying. We ran into her room, and sure enough, she had passed away. Obviously. Given the shock of my grandmother dying, my mother and I didn't sit around chatting about how weird the whole experience was. But months, or perhaps even years later, I asked her about that night, and she has no memory of telling me that my grandmother was up and walking around the house. She doesn't even remember what woke her up, or why she woke me up, gives me shivers just writing it. Account 13. When I was eight, my family moved from urban South Florida to a really small town in North Florida. It was like from a Goosebumps book. A lot of weird stuff has happened in the 15 years since we moved there, but the weirdest has got to be when my sister moved back in with my parents. My sister's husband had been shipped off to Afghanistan, so she was left alone with a newborn son. Not wanting to go through the soul-crushing loneliness of raising a newborn all alone in a trailer in the woods, she moved back into my parents' house for a while. She said it started first when the headboard of her bed would slam every now and then. Then one day she woke up because somebody was tickling her. She didn't really think about it until one night she woke my mom up by screaming, My sister is almost 30. She's not a little kid. And my mom went in and the whole fucking bed was rocking and shaking like, really violently up down to the sides, like a boat going through white water, but my mom and sister have been through a lot of shit. So they persevered. One night, my sister was nursing her son, and something grabbed her ponytail and started yanking her head around. My mom went in the room and very sternly, like talking to a bad kid, said, I understand things are different. There's a little baby here and there never has been before. You're curious. I understand that. But you will not touch them anymore. You can look. You can stay. You were here before us. But I swear to God you are not allowed to touch them. It stopped happening. 
Account 14. I was walking up the hall at work, and my heel went out from under me and bent my leg wonky. I didn't even fall, but lowered myself down because my leg felt weird. The woman whose office I was walking past came out to find out what the loud, crunchy noise she heard was. The noise was my leg breaking, and she was more traumatized than I was. She had nightmares for a while and had a hard time seeing me when I returned to work. TLDR, I gave my co-worker PTSD with the sound of my fibula snapping. Account 15. My family and I were in Gettysburg, PA, when I was eight or so. We had just arrived that day, but my dad wanted to check out and get pictures of this memorial called the Eternal Light Peace Memorial. Before the park closed, the sun was just about to set. My mother, brother, and I all stayed in the car because we were cranky, hungry little shits. But my dad got out to look at the statue and cannons for a few minutes. All of a sudden, me and my mom saw two figures appear on the edge of the field out of the woods, opposite the side we were parked. They were all tan, I mean, head to toe. There was no other color of hair, skin, eyes at all. And one was pointing in the general direction of the memorial. They went back into the woods and then reappeared, but with another one in tow, the incident lasted about three five minutes total, and they just stood there looking. It was such an eerie feeling. To this day, my mom and I have not forgotten about it. We could see them fairly clearly because they weren't too far away. The creepiest part was that we went to a museum the next day, and they had old Confederate uniforms on display. We came to one that was labeled that it was from Tennessee. I don't remember more details. And it was the same exact color as the ones we saw. Other uniforms had slight variations, but this was dead on. My mom and I were a hundred sure of it. Part 3. Account 1. When we first moved into the house I grew up in, I used to hear things calling my name from the opposite end of the house, like I would be in my room playing with Legos or something, and I would hear my dad call my name from his room, so I'd go to my parents' bedroom and ask them what they wanted, and they'd always tell me that they never called my name. Being a little kid, I honestly started to think that they were playing a joke on me, because this happened about once every couple of days. Well, one night it happened, and I went to ask them what they wanted, like always. But right as I stepped into their room, I heard my mom's voice calling for me from the living room, which is all the way on the other side of the house. It was at that exact point that I knew no one was tricking me. Because I was looking at both of my parents sitting in front of me, I kind of kept this to myself until my brother was diagnosed with partial narcolepsy. One of the symptoms of narcolepsy is apparently oral hallucinations, so I thought maybe I had it too. Went and got myself checked, completely fine, so I have no idea what was calling my name all those years, and I still hear it at night whenever I come visit and stay over. Account 2. My brother. I were both under seven years old. He may be four and I six. We were playing outside in the snow when a strange white car pulled into our long driveway. This was uncommon since our driveway was hidden. The window rolls down. A man with short hair and goatee pulls up a camera and takes our picture. Then he rolls up the window and drives away. Never had any closure or follow-up on that situation, but it freaked my mom out so bad. Account 3. So, my uncle used to work a lot when I was younger. He's done a lot of different things to make money, but one consistent thing is that in the summer months and into late fall, he paints houses. It's a legitimate business and everything. He's got a truck with a number and a name and supplies in the back. The works. Every now and then, he would call my dad when he needed a little extra help, and I'd work for him. No big deal, really. It's just painting houses. What could possibly go wrong? Well, it takes a while to paint a whole house. If the weather conditions aren't right, then you can't paint. One particular fall was extremely wet. It rained what felt like every single day. My uncle would paint multiple houses at a time, so sometimes he would get caught up due to situations like these, and I'd work a little more than usual. That was fine by me, though. The job wasn't hard, and it paid well. Anyway, it was a warm day for late fall, but there was still a distinct chill in the air, one that kind penetrated through you and stung your soul. My uncle had this job he had to finish. It was an old Victorian house in a quiet part of town, a lady and her husband, who was an author, lived there, due to the weather it had taken longer than expected to paint the house. 
and there were family issues going on at the time, which further complicated things. So, my uncle gets a call one day from the lady who lives at the house. She says that her husband is trying to write his next book, but he keeps getting distracted by the scaffolding outside the house, so she wanted to know if we could come over and finish the job as soon as possible. My uncle was always an honest businessman. They had contracted him to do the job in mid-summer. Account 4. I posted this on another through a few weeks ago. About a month ago, I went over to my girlfriend's house. Except I felt really uneasy when I went into the living room. Turns out... They replaced a china cabinet with one of her grandmothers, whom passed away a few months back. Her grandmother was bedridden in the hospital, and I've ever gotten to meet her. I felt uneasy the whole time. Being around her grandmother's furniture made me so anxious and almost sad. When I told her she said it was probably nothing, she went to the bathroom. When I went over to the cabinet, it was about six feet tall, dark wood. It had two doors on the side and glass up front and in the back was a mirror. I was looking at the teacups and small baby dolls when I could swear I saw someone in the mirror behind me. Just a silhouette, I called out to my girlfriend. But as I did, I heard a shrill screech from the bathroom. I start pounding on the door, and it opens. She was sitting on the floor, crying. She said she saw someone in the bathroom mirror. We booked it out of her house. No shoes, no jacket, nothing in right to my car. I dove for an hour or so, with no destination. When I returned her to her house, her mom was sitting on the doorstep. She said she kept seeing shadows move. Nope. I will go out of my way to make things like this happen. Someone claims their house is haunted. I want to see. Someone said they think they saw a skinwalker. My friends are looking. I've never found anything. But this, this was something else. Count five. When I was in nursing school long ago, there was a lady that did not want to be resuscitated by all means. Later, she became altered, and her family gained power attorney over her. They changed her code status from DNR to full code, even though that was not their mother's wishes, since they had power attorney over her. We had to follow the children's wishes. The lady went into VFib with no pulse or breathing. We started CPR to the code chart arrived at the bedside. The doctor went to administer a shock, but the machine failed. He tried again and again. The machine would not deliver the shock. The minute she passed on, the machine worked. The hospital checks the defibrator daily, and it not working has never, ever happened before. In the end, the lady ended up getting her wish of no resuscitation. Everyone was freaked out over this. I have been a nurse 20 years and never seen this happen before. Account 6. I was 16 and woke up in the middle of the night to seeing my clothes being rustled about in my doorway. After washing my clothes, I like to hang dry them on my doorframe. I notice some really gray, veiny-looking legs, and then I see these really long, pointed sticks moving through my clothes. It took me a second, but my sleepy eyes adjusted to see one of the most grotesque, demon-looking motherfuckers I have ever seen. He was extremely skinny and had a intended stomach. His skin was gray and veiny, and those long sticks were his fingers. His chin was long. His eyes had no lids on them and were unusually big. His tiny mouth was in a pucker and moved like he was eating an imaginary lollipop. His hunchback looked as though it tore out of the strange hospital gown he was wearing. He just stared at me, and I tried to scream my grandmother awake who was sharing a room with me for the weekend. He wouldn't stop staring and I stared back and tried to shake my grandmother awake. I started noticing other things about him, like how large and cone-like his head was and how hairless and shriveled he looked as he stood still, surprised I could see him. My grandmother woke up, looked towards the door, and he was gone. In the weeks leading to this encounter, I had been experiencing strange things in my house, like my bedroom door slamming and locking on its own. One night I woke up to what felt like several hands touching my feet and legs and horrible nightmares. After the experience with this strange gray man, I told my parents and they had my room exercised. IDK. If an exorcism really made those horrible things stop or gave me peace of mind from things I was manifesting myself, all I know is I don't experience those things anymore and I'll never sleep with a door open again. Tell DR. I saw a demon who was surprised I could see him and had to exercise my room. Not sure if real or I manifested it in my stressed-out teenage brain. Account 7. 
When I was in elementary school, my family decided to add on to our house. So we hired an architect and contractor. We live in an old colonial home that was built to be historically correct, i.e. 200-year-old soft wood floors, proper paint colors, etc. Because of this, my parents chose to have all of the wood trim painted in the addition. The contractor didn't want to because we actually bought quality wood, and he thought it was a waste of time. So we ended up hiring another contractor after about a year of arguing and having almost no work done on the house. Even though the contractor and his team were consistently being paid, the new contractor was one that my parents, lawyer, had met through church. Most of his team also went to that same church. Now, we always tried to be hospitable towards the workmen and would offer them drinks and snacks, particularly in the summer. We live in a hot, humid climate that is pretty much unbearable. So, my mom would send me outside with lemonade and the like for the workers. They were all really nice. And I remember having conversations, nice conversations with them, about whatever now nine-year-old me found interesting. I particularly remember this one guy named Kenny, the actually contractor never showed up on the job, and Kenny was put in charge, kind of like a gopher. He was always really nice to me. Anyways... A few months after they finally finished the addition on our house, I think it took about two and a half years, Kenny's name is published in the newspaper, he was put in prison for charges of pedophilia. Before he worked at our house, he had been on a list of sex offenders. The contractor found this detail about his employee unnecessary to share with my parents. I was an elementary age girl at the time, my brother was in middle school, my parents would leave us home alone with the workmen there on occasion. Thinking about this still gives me the creeps I can't. Account 8. It's not something I tell people on a daily basis, but when I was little, I'm going to say 7 or 8. I woke up to a banging on the window. At first I figured it was just the wind and tried to shrug it off to go back to sleep, but I kept hearing footsteps in my room. My room had a large enough area for you to walk in circles in front of my bed. You know the kind of noises that are just supposed to be the house settling in? It sounded like someone was circling my room. I used to sleep with the radio on, and at this very moment it was playing a very depressing song that I can't remember the name of, but if I hear it on the radio, I get the creep still. So that really started to scare me. The room also felt as if it was getting colder. At this point I was really scared. I decided to make a run for it to my parents' room down the hall. As I passed through the area where the foots were, I got so incredibly cold that I could see my breath and I froze for a sec only to hear the words, I'm lost. I bolted to my parents' room, hid under their bed and cried myself to sleep. Account 9. We were living with my grandparents at the time. In my aunt's room was a two-foot-tall Victorian-style doll converted into a lamp. The lamp would only turn on by holding the doll's cold plastic hand and raising and lowering the arm. The doll stood on a nightstand next to my aunt's bed, facing the door, greeting everyone who entered with a creepy dead eye smile. I was alone in the house one day and wanted a blanket from my aunt's closet. Luckily for this scaredy cat, there were two important factors that worked in my favor. One, it was mid-afternoon and wouldn't need the lamp's light, and a two, the closet was located immediately next to the door's entrance, so without lifting my gaze, I stared at the floor, entered the room, and turned 180 degrees. Now my back was towards the doll, I quickly swung open the closet door and reached down for a blanket, when suddenly something about the room was different, brighter. The light was on, and the peach fuzz hairs on the back of my neck uncurled. I froze for an eternity then felt my survival instinct kick in and wanted to run screaming in horror. But before all that, I still had to look. Man, I wish I hadn't looked. As I turned to exit the room, I lifted my stupid head only to confirm that the doll's hand was raised and that it was pointed directly at me. Such traumatizing vision burned in my brain since I was 13. Much uneasy, creepy memory. Account 10. A few years ago, there was a small plane accident that occurred in a neighboring town. I was part of the county volunteer search rescue group. And when we got the call, I was one of the responders to help try and see if there was any chance of a survivor from the crash. 
We found out from the sheriff that was there that it was an elderly couple and their young granddaughter that were in this plane. Immediately, it went dead silent. You could see the life drain from the other responders' faces as soon as it was said, upon getting to the area that the crash happened at, it was clear that there would be no survivors from this accident. It wouldn't have a happy ending. There would be no joyful and tear-filled reunion. This plane was absolutely destroyed. Our lead turned to the group and said if anybody was uncomfortable or not willing to do the recovery of the bodies, there would be no hard feelings or anything held against them. Some people just aren't cut out for this. About half of the group said they wouldn't couldn't do it. They helped set up the repelling lines, made some radio calls to other teams that were lower on the hillside helping us navigate through the broken trees and aircraft parts to get to where we expected to find the bodies. I'll never forget the feeling of complete, utter numbness I experienced that day. The first thing any of us saw was this small stuffed teddy bear and the blood that had soaked onto it. When we finally were able to get down to the bodies, we had to stop and collect ourselves. It was heartbreaking to see this little girl with such empty, devoid eyes. She was gone. Never to grow up and experience life like most of us had. Never to know the joys, aches, frustrations, sadness, excitement, and everything else life throws at you. I've seen a lot in my few years as an EMT. I've seen drug overdoses, diabetic shock, car crashes, suicides of all manners, but this fucked me up for a while. Nobody should have to go through what we went through to help bring closure for the family. Nobody should have to deal with bringing back a child in a body bag. But if I don't stand up and do it, someone else has to bear the heartache, the depression, the numbness, and I don't ever want someone else to experience it like I did. Account 11. Not all that scary, but relatively creepy. A couple of friends and I were at the annual fair held at a local park one year. Being 14-year-old girls, we thought we would be ah cool and separate from the large crowd at the fair by walking along a rather long walking trail that starts at the fairgrounds and travels on for a few miles. Well, it was late in the evening, and the lighting was bad. We were sitting at the mouth of a tunnel, which sat at the top of a secluded hill. When a lady with a baby approached us, she asked us if we knew a man who was standing at the bottom of the hill near a bench looking in our general direction. We told her we didn't, and her response was, well, he's been following you for a while. I don't know what he's up to, but you should be careful. Needless to say, we high tailed it back to the fair. Account 12. When I was a kid, I had to go to sleep early at about 8 p.m. I was laying in my bed, staring at the hallway lights, listening to my family laugh in the kitchen. I was squinting my eyes to see how long I could make the light rays extend out. Then there appeared an old translucent lady with long, curly, yellow hair, and she wore a purple flower dress. She stared at me with a smile half the size of her face. I kid you not. I tried to scream, but nothing came out, so I placed the blanket over my head and cried myself to sleep. The next morning I asked my sister if we had a visitor the night before. My words probably were, Did an old white lady visit us last night? She said no. I told her what I had seen, and she said it probably was my guardian angel. Thinking of it now, I have to say. Bullshit. That's some freaky way to say hello. My classmate later mentioned to his friends, he saw a teenage boy with the same half the size of your face smile standing at night in his backyard as he was going to close the garage door. His reaction was to run back into the house. TLDR. The moral is guardian angels exist, and they like to exaggerate their smiles while staring at you in the night. Account 13. A friend of mine is the type who always has wacky adventures and funny stories to tell. I swear half the reason I keep her in my life is for the entertainment value of the crazy shit that happens to her. But this one wasn't funny. When she was about 20, she was leaving a bar one night. Legal age here is 19, and as she was saying goodbyes to her friends, a fight broke out between a couple of other guys nearby. It was brief. Basically, one of them shouted at the other for eyeballing his woman or some BS, then just pulls a knife, stabs him right in the gut, and bolts. This was not a sketchy neighborhood or anything. It was about as unexpected as if someone had pulled a knife in a mall food court. My friend has fortunately had some first aid training, but she's never actually had to use them before. 
Somehow her instincts kick in. She staunches the wound, is keeping him conscious and aware, enlists someone to call 911, all that jazz, tended to him for nearly 20 minutes, though she lost all concept of time, when the paramedics came. She just stood up and walked off to sit down on a nearby bench, covered in a stranger's blood. She had gone into shock and didn't move from that spot for a good half hour. Fortunately, the paramedics were smart enough to realize that they should take care of her, too. So once they got the guy stable and into the ambulance, they gave her a blanket and talked to her a bit to make sure she was going to be all right and that she had friends who would make sure she got home. So it all turned out okay. But it's still the most WTF horrifying story that's ever happened to someone I know personally. Account 14. When I was 18, my grandfather was having heart problems. I would wake up every morning and go to his house to see him. I would just talk to him, help him around the house and watch TV with him. He has been really lonely since my grandmother died three months ago. I will never forget this moment. It was June 7th. I arrive at his house and my grandfather has the biggest smile on his face. I was so happy to see him smiling. He looks at me and says, guess what? I'm going to go see my wife in two days. At the moment, I thought my grandpa lost it. Believe it or not, my grandfather died two days later in his sleep. The thought of it is scary, creepy, and disturbing. It is like he knew he is going to die in two days. On a side note, the last two days he was alive, he was smiling and peaceful. I can't explain it. It felt like he knew something we don't know. Account 15. When I was 13, my mom used to drop me home from school and then pick my brother up. One day, I was dropped home and went on the computer like always. Minutes later, I heard the sink in our kitchen turn on and off and the microwave door open and shut. I assumed that my mom still hadn't left and didn't think anything of it. Another couple minutes go by and I hear my mom and brother come in. I greet them saying, wow, that was fast, you just left. My mom was confused and said that she left a while ago. I'm still not sure what happened. I think the scariest part was not expecting that something weird was happening. Part 4. Account 1. Every time I stay at my grandma's house, I hear someone walking upstairs. It starts at one side of the room, casually walks to the other and stops. This will happen maybe twice a night. I didn't start hearing it until I was about 14, when my grandparents made me start sleeping in a different room on the first floor because they starting sleeping in separate bedrooms. Blah, blah, blah. Regardless, both of their rooms are also on the first floor. For a little backstory, I have always been afraid of the upstairs at their house. I don't know why, but it's always freaked me out, and I refuse to ever go up there alone. I'm 23 now, still won't go up alone. There's one room specifically, though it's a long, narrow bedroom. When you open the door, there are closets on your left and right, a bed placed roughly in the middle of the room, and a window on the far side opposite the door. I was told growing up by my grandparents that the sons of the previous owner claimed to see a odd gorilla come out of the closet at night, dance around the room, and go back into the closet. I thought nothing of this story until I had to start sleeping in the other room. The room located directly below the scary room upstairs, so we all go to bed. All the lights in the house are off and I'm still awake lying on the bed. Then I heard it. Thump. 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 Starting at one end of the room upstairs. It got closer to me, passed right above me, and continued to the end of the room where it stopped. I'm wide awake, terrified out of my mind. It was no question to me that I had heard footsteps. I knew that slow, casual pace. I was freaked out and went to my grandpa's room. I told him what I heard. He told me that the house is old and it creaks. But he turned the dining room light on for me so I felt a little safer. I tried going back to sleep. Then it started again. This time from where it ended the first time. By the window upstairs, it walks over me again and stops when it reached the door. I thought it was over until five seconds later when I heard it coming down the stairs. One, two, three, four, five. Silence as it reached the landing. Then six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And silence again as it reached the first floor. I was frozen in shock. Whatever it was, it was on my floor of the house and sadly unaffected by the dining room light. I was staring at the doorway to my room. The dining room light was shining in and my vision began to distort. 
I felt dizzy with fear, so I pulled the blankets over my head and suddenly heard a scratching sound from inside my room. I knew exactly where it was coming from, too. My grandpa's gun case. It was a very obvious sound, scratching on the wood. Long scratches down the front of the gun case door. I could even hear the door ever so slightly tapping against the frame as each scratch began. I tried to scream and I couldn't. I took a second to take a deep breath and let out a loud scream. In seconds, my grandpa had made it to my room and I was relieved. Needless to say, he still didn't believe me. So I did what any normal person would do. I draped a sheet over the side of the bed and slept underneath it. I wrapped myself tight in a comforter, put on headphones and turned my back to the door. There could be a party of ghosts in my room and I wouldn't even know. The next morning, my grandpa told my grandma about what happened the night before. She said, oh, that's silly. You know, your cousin woke me up the last time she stayed here. She came in my room saying, I hear footsteps. I slept under the bed for the rest of my week's stay with them. I've stayed there countless times since that happened, and I hear the footsteps every time. I sleep on top of the bed now, but keep my back to the door and sleep with headphones on. I haven't heard it come down the stairs since that first night, but if it does, I don't want to know. Edits because I'm bad at writing and I can't stay in the same tense. Account 2. When I was about seven, my two brothers and I were playing in an area that was used as an unofficial motocross place. We decided to dig a tunnel for some reason. Being the extra smart guys we were, it took a few hours to dig about six ift in and two feet high. I was right up at the face when suddenly the tunnel collapsed. It was all dirt with no supports. My world went instantly black and hot. By hot, I mean furnace hot. I couldn't move a muscle from the weight of the soil completely enclosing me. I started to really panic, as you do. Everything started turning red, which I guess was blood being forced into my head. Every breath was getting harder as the soil constrained me more and more. Even though my hands were near my face, I couldn't move my arms to clear the dirt around my head and also started breathing in dirt which made me cough, which made me contract my stomach, and then I couldn't draw breath at all. This isn't what made me panic, though. The total darkness turning red with the incredible heat made my young mind think I was going to hell. I don't know how long I was buried for, but it seemed like an eternity. Suddenly, I felt something grab one of my feet. My brothers had been frantically digging through the collapse to pull me out and managed to reach me and then pull me out. We never told my parents... I just went home and got hosed down, TLDR got buried alive and pissed myself. Account 3. Posted this before, but I'll do it again. I was on Manassas Battlefield with my father when I was younger. We were sitting on the back of his tailgate eating McDonald's on top of a hill looking at some cannons. It was foggy and misty out that day with a slight chill. November, I think. All of the sudden we see a man dressed in full Civil War attire waving at us standing by the cannons about 50, 100 meters away. My dad had a pair of binoculars with him, and we got a closer look of the man. He appeared to be in a Confederate uniform and was standing stationary, only moving his arm to wave. It was a, come here, wave. My dad thought there was a reenactment going on and the, that the man needed help. So my dad walked down to the man while I watched with the binoculars. When my dad got close to the man, he stopped walking and had a confused posture. After a couple seconds next to the man, he turns around and sprints back to me. He proceeds to throw everything in the back of the truck, and we leave the battlefield in a hurry, my dad said. While walking down there, the man slowly disappeared, and my dad said he got the strangest feeling in his stomach and mad chills. To this day, my dad gets the chills and goosebumps telling the story. My dad saw combat in Vietnam, so he is not an easy guy to scare. From my perspective, my dad was right next to the guy and never disappeared. We don't know what we saw, but I think it was a ghost. TLDR. I think we saw a ghost of a Confederate soldier. Account 4. When I was a child, I lived in an old Victorian house, and I would always hear laughing while I was trying to sleep. I was an only child with a single mother, and when I was about 5'6", I would wake up hearing laughter in the hallway in the middle of the night. After mentioning this to my mum, she swore it was probably just the TV being left on late, one night. 
I awoke hearing the laughter in my room. I went to sit up, but felt like there was someone holding my shoulders down, invisible hands gripping into my shoulders while I heard laughing. I screamed my little heart out. My mum ran into my room, flicking on the bedside lamp, convincing me it was just a dream until I said, but my shoulders hurt. She lifted up my T-shirt, and there were two adult-sized handprints on my shoulders. I honestly thought I had imagined it and that it had never happened. But the other day I mentioned it in passing to my mum, and she went blanket white and said, I don't want to remember that. Account 5. About four years ago I woke up one late morning on a day off at 1021. You'll learn why I remember this four years later in a second. I got out of bed, used the restroom, got dressed, etc., I went back into my room and picked up my phone to check for messages, and the clock in the phone said 1025. I was surprised, because I know that it did not take me only four minutes to dress. I'd lingered in the warm bathroom quite a while and brushed my teeth too, etc. I looked at my bedroom alarm clock to confirm, since that was the clock I'd looked at when I woke up. It also said 10 to 25. I shrugged it off and figured in my sleepy, just woke up state, I'd misread the original 1021. I went downstairs, turned on the PC, turned on the news on the TV to listen to, and started cooking breakfast. I wanted microwave up some rice leftovers from last night, so I went to pop them in the microwave. The time on the microwave was 1025. I whipped out my phone to check the time. It still said 1025. There was no way. There was no way that I checked the clock upstairs, walked downstairs, turned on the PC and the TV, got a glass of water, and started cooking eggs in the matter of less than a minute. I decided to stand there and watch the microwave clock while counting to 60. I figured if it didn't turn to 1026 in 60 seconds of less, clearly it was malfunctioning. It turned to 1026 about 20 seconds into my count, which made sense. It had been 1025 for a while before I looked. I finished making my breakfast, plated it up, and took it over to the PC like the lonely slob I am. The time on the PC said 10.20. I pulled out my phone. My phone also said 10.20. That's when I started writing all this shit down. I pulled up the little clock toolbar and watched the second hand go around. While I watched it, time seemed to pass normally. It ticked to 10.21 and 10.22 as I watched the second hand go around. Over the next what felt like an hour or so, maybe hour and a half, all the clocks in my house, as well as internet ones, seemed to pass time normally while I observed them. But if I looked away for a while, at least two minutes or so, they'd make no sense. At one point, about 15 minutes after these events, the cell phone and PC read 10 to 14, then later 10 to 13 then back into the 1020 SS, after the hour, hour and a half. They normalized, and I've never experienced it since. TLDR, one day all my clocks went fucking insane. Count six. After we moved into our new house last year, our neighborhood is one of the oldest in the country. Dates back to the mid 1600 hours. The house we live in was built in 1827. One night I woke up, turned over to the side of the bed, and saw a man dressed in very, very old formal attire at the side of the bed, leering at me in the exact manner you describe. I blinked and he was gone, but that look, the strained, gigantic smile is not going to leave my memory for a long time. Count seven. I was living in this apartment in Oslo that just had this weird vibe. There were three of us living there, two girls and I. This was a building from the mid-1800s. Several weird things happened there, one of the rooms I didn't want to even go in. It was cold, even if the rest of the place was perfectly warm. Every time I was in there, thoughts of children crying or being in some kind of peril went through my head. I can't explain any better. I could not stay in there for very long. My room was the old living room. And one morning I awoke to something growling like a big cat or snarling dog in my room. I was pinned down in my bed, although nothing was there. I could not move. I was scared shitless. One of the girls I lived with had a cat. And even though it was only a year old, it just suddenly died. We were just hanging out, and all of a sudden we heard the cat making these horrible sounds. It was just lying in the bathroom on the floor, tongue out, gasping for air and making this horrible sound. Then it died. It took like ten minutes. 
I moved out of that place shortly after. I'm a very big skeptic. I don't believe in ghosts, etc. But that place was really unnerving. Account 8. This is from the very first comment I made on Reddit. It was pretty creepy and somewhat disturbing. When I was 15 or 16, my three or four year old sister drank some green nail polish remover she got from the bathroom sink. It looked like mouthwash. We guess she was imitating our parents. Our neighborhood pharmacy had an assistant rush over some Ipecac and something else. Malox, maybe IDK. While we were waiting, she was on the bathroom floor in pain when she told us, I drank some green stuff and died one time. My husband ran off with a girl and I got sad and drank some green stuff and died. My girls were crying and sad when I died. We were freaked. Sister is fine. TLDR. My three or four year old... Sister told us of her suicide in a previous life. Account 9. I was in high school, the bus had just dropped me off, and I was unlocking the front door when a grown man on came onto the lawn and asked me if I had any money. I said no. He kept approaching me, I got the door unlocked, and then Bear, my 100-pound, solid, black, territorial, working German shepherd, came barking and growling, practically frothing at the mouth. The creep took one look at Bear and noped the fuck out of there. I don't like to think what would have happened if I hadn't had Bear. Account 10. When I was in high school, I had a class in what was known as the Orange Hall. Every day in that class, I would annoying hear someone whistling the song, Pop. Goes the weasel, but really slowly. Two years later, when I had a class in the same hall, I heard it again nearly every day. Now my sister is in high school, and her friend said something about someone whistling the song. I found this strange because my sister is so much younger than me. There is no way the same annoying student was still there doing this every day. She said she asked her teacher about it, and the teacher said, that happens every day around the same time. It's been happening for 10 years, and they've never been able to find anyone whistling in the halls. Account 11. I was on holiday in Cancun, Mexico. It was 2005, and I was 15. Having been for a swim, I decided to go and get a shower and changed before getting something to eat. I entered the apartment and went through to my room, grabbed my stuff, and entered the bathroom. As I shut the bathroom door behind me, I felt something fall onto my hand. When I looked, I saw a large black Mexican hell monster with a few too many legs for my taste. It completely covered the back of my hand, and in the brief second I looked at it, I determined it was some sort of spider tarantula. Now, being from England, I am neither used to or capable of dealing with such creatures, so was forced to rely on pure human instinct. This was it. Fight or flight. Kill or be killed. This was my moment to prove I had become a man. I could tame the beast and parade it in front of my family. I could prove to the world I was its master, and no beast on this planet could take me down. I let out a sudden roar and started shaking my hand violently to force this monstrosity off while making my way on top of the toilet seat. It fell on the floor and lay still, not moving an inch. I grew in confidence and put one foot back on the floor to investigate. Suddenly it got up. This time I screamed like a believer who had just got a retweet. I retreated back to the sanctuary of the toilet seat and watched in horror as this thing scurried towards me. It had climbed to the top of the door and waited for me. The toilet seat no longer felt safe. It was going to kill me. It was then I noticed it only had six legs and was not moving like any sort of spider I knew of. My fear started to fade. I recognized the shape of the animal but couldn't put my finger on what it was. It had a large body and long spindly legs. Turns out it was a crab that didn't have any pincers. I have no idea how it got into the bathroom, as there was no windows and the door was shut. I captured it in a pan and released it near the lagoon. I like to think it got eaten by an alligator, the little fucker. Account 12. This isn't my story, but a former teacher told it to me and swears it is true. She said that when she was a child, she shared a room with her younger sister. One night she was in her bed, and her sister told her to look toward the door. She looked up and saw the silhouette of a man standing in the doorway. She had a light switch right next to her bed, so she turned it on, and there was nobody in the doorway. They called for their dad, and he came in, asking them what was wrong. They told him what they had seen, and he said it was probably just their eyes playing tricks on them. 
The next day, my teacher went downstairs and saw her father sitting at the kitchen table just staring. She asked him what was wrong, and he said, Was the man you saw a tall man? She claims that each member of the family saw the silhouette a number of times over the years, and each time it was the same thing, they would turn on a light, and there would be nobody there. I've been creeped out ever since she told me this story. Account 13. Junior year of high school, I get off a couple of bus stops early to hang out at a friend's house after school. We're playing video games when my friend's mom gets a call from mine, angrily telling me to come home. I thought I was busted for not coming right home, but she seemed particularly angry and scared at this infraction. When I get home, my mom, sister and sister's friend, are kind of frazzled and in shock. My mom is angrily asking me where I was and what I was doing after school. She doesn't believe my story of going directly to my friend's house after school and being there the whole time. I'm sent to my room. A few minutes later, my sister comes in and asks me the same thing, to which I respond with the same answer and ask, Why is everyone acting so weird and freaked out? While I was at my friend's house, my mom heard a voice saying my name from her bedroom window. When she looks outside to our backyard, she sees my sister, her friend, and a guy with no shirt on, hugging my sister's friend from behind. My mom swears it was me and goes out back to reprimand me for shirtlessly hugging on my sister's friend. When my mom gets outside, she just finds the two of them. There have only been the two of them out there the entire time. My mom doesn't believe them because she clearly heard a man's voice and saw the shirtless guy out there. She interrogates them as to my whereabouts because she thinks they are covering for me and I was somewhere in hiding. So here's the spooky part. My sister's friend came over because she needed someone to talk to. It was the one-year anniversary of her fiancé's suicide. Her fiancé and I share the same name. My mom had no context of any of this when she saw the male figure out back with her TLDR. -E. My mom saw the ghost of my sister's friend's fiancé. Account 14. My friend's friend went to Vegas once to blow off some steam. She then went to a club and met a guy she thought was super cute. She hung out with him the whole night, and they made out a bit. He asked her to come home with him. She declined, as she wasn't really one to do that, but she made plans to hang out with him later. A few days later, she developed sores around her mouth, so she went to the doctor. Turns out she had contracted a flesh-eating bacteria. Not only that but it was a strain that is only found in humans that consume other humans' flesh. The woman called the cops and they went to the guy's apartment. They found body parts in the fridge. Apparently, he had been going to clubs, taking women home with him and then eating them. And that is precisely why I will never go home with a guy. Part 5. Account 1. Okay, this is 100 true. I'm 23 now, and this happened about 10 years ago, so I was probably 13 or 14. Anyway, I used to skate, board, all the time with my friends, Tim and Brandon. One day, we got done skating, and we decided to go to 7-Eleven to get some food, drinks before we went home. Remember, I was only 13, 14, so we weren't driving. We had skated to the 7-Eleven, and were planning on skating, walking back home. Anyway, we buy our drinks, and we left the store. We walked to the parking lot's exit and prepared to cross the highway. It's not a bust highway, since it's a small town. While we waited for the traffic light to turn red so that we could cross, I looked behind me at the 7-Eleven gas pumps. I noticed a 40 and 50 year old man pumping gas into his white truck. He stared at me, and before I knew it, he dropped the gas pump and jumped into his truck. He slammed on the gas and sped straight at my friends and I. He missed us, but he grazed my arm and knocked my skateboard out of my hand. My friend Brandon screamed, Waff, you fucking dick! As the man peeled out and sped into the parking lot next to 7-Eleven, I swear to God he drove through a ditch, which was between 7-Eleven's parking lot and the parking lot he was in, and tried to run us over again, this is where it got bad. The three of us started running at full speed, across the highway and toward the local library, which is like 2.3 blocks from 7 to 11. 
When we were about 1.2 a block away, I looked back and saw the maniac speeding toward us. Full of rage, Brandon and Tim ran up to the library doors, and I ran towards the woods. It was Sunday, so I knew the library was closed, and there was a trail in the woods which led to my backyard. Meanwhile, this maniac peeled into the parking lot and hopped out of his truck. I looked behind me before escaping into the woods and saw him grab either a shotgun or a crowbar. I was pretty far away at this point, and I was freaking out so my vision wasn't great. From the bed of his truck, I ran all the way home. When I got to my street, my neighbor, Tim's dad, told me to get in his car because we had to go to the video store, which is where Tim's mom worked. When I got there, I found Tim and Brandon. They ran to the video store after realizing that the library was closed, and three cops. A minute later, my mom came in, crying her eyes out because Brandon and Tim told her they didn't know if I lived or not. Everyone had thought that I was captured. Tim told me that he saw the guy running after me into the woods, which is scary because I thought the maniac was chasing them, not me. Anyway, he was never caught, and I spent the next five years worrying about every white truck I saw. Edit, I forgot the most scary part. My town is small, but it's not empty. There were plenty of people around. While this was going on, I felt so helpless, running for my life. While there were at least 100 people around, not doing a thing about it. Also, to be clear, we didn't provoke this man at all. He tried to hit us for no reason. And that's creepy. Brandon called him a dick, but that was after he tried to run us over. We were good kids, trying to walk home, and we almost died. Got seriously hurt because of it. Oh, also, bust highway, busy highway. Account 2. First, I was in a bank, I think. Then some guy pulls up a gun and starts shooting everybody. I then wake up. I tell my roommate about the dream. We shared a room, and then he pulls up a gun and shoots me. Then I wake up for real, but I'm mortified because I have no idea if it's real or not. So I just sat there silently until I fell back to sleep. Account 3. I took a picture of Spranger Springs, I believe it was called. And not only did my camera die about four times while trying to take a picture, I had to keep changing batteries. The one picture I did get, you could clearly see the outline of a soldier standing next to it glancing downward. Another weird thing was I took a picture of my ex standing under the rocks at Devil's Den, and he made a silly face with his mouth open, but the picture ended up looking like his mouth was stretched super far down his face. Other than that, some pictures just had a ridiculous amount of orb-like things in them. Also, we stayed at the super haunted Farnsworth Inn there, and all night someone was pounding on the wall on and off in the room next to ours, so it was banging even with our heads while laying in bed. We complained about it in the morning to the staff, and we found out the room was unoccupied that night. Account 4. I was asleep in the living room and was suddenly awake, like wide awake. I hear my cat growling and looking over across the room, and I look over to and see a big silhouette faintly human-shaped. I couldn't see any eyes or anything, but I knew it was looking at me. I slowly sat up and leaned in closer to look at it, and if didn't move... I probably sat there for ten minutes locked in contact with it before a sudden feeling of peace washed over me, and I laid down and comfortably went to sleep. I woke up the next morning and saw nothing there that could make that shape. It is safe to say I don't sleep in the living room anymore. Account 5. My grandfather's company, Does Timber, Mining, was setting up an office in a relatively remote part of a third world county, and found a house that was dirt cheap, even for third world country standards. Obviously, there was a catch. The villagers in that area told him not to purchase it, since the house was haunted, and everyone who had ever lived there died violently. He decided it was just some superstitious BS and got it anyway. So the guy setting up the office will live on the top floor of the house with this family, and the lower floors for the office. He moved in with his wife and three kids. Anyway, my grandfather suddenly got no news from him for the longest time, since this was in a remote part of a third world country. He wasn't too worried since he just assumed they lost power or something. He finally contacted the local police to go check on the guy, since he was completely unreachable. They found everyone dead. Apparently the guy killed his wife, kids, and then himself with a machete. Yes, not a gun, a fucking machete. He actually hacked himself to death. 
It wasn't one of those cuts on the wrists to let everyone slowly bleed to death. Everyone was hacked down, including the guy himself. The description of the scene had to be an exaggeration, since I'm assuming the sight of five decapitated bodies, including three kids, were scary enough to make people see things, so I won't bother putting it here since I'm not sure what's true, and there were details that people could not have witnessed. Let's just say I stopped paying attention after I heard the phrase, Magic Machete. I was told entire room was covered in blood, including the ceiling. Some people were saying the blood on the ceiling had to have gotten there because high threw the bodies around, I had to explain about blood pressure and got tons of weird looks. Now, the weird part, if this isn't weird enough, was that he managed to barricade the door with the bed, with his wife and kids on it, and it's one of those gigantic old beds that's extremely hard to move. The locals say this is evidence he was possessed by spirits. I say moving to the middle of nowhere in some third world country drove the guy nuts and crazy people can do all sorts of crazy shit and even perform crazy feats of strength. Anyway, my grandfather had to pay a few bribes to make sure nothing gets to the press. Not hard, middle of nowhere, about the entire thing and get the police to classify the deaths as natural. No idea how they'll explain that. Third world countries are awesome. All employees in the know had to sign an NDA too. He then tried getting other volunteers to set up the office. Even if they haven't heard all the gory details because of my grandfather's gag order, everyone knew the previous guy died, no one volunteered, he promoted one guy, gave him a fancy title and told him he's in charge of setting up that office, the guy quit. Account 6. I used to work as a cleaner at my school after class, so by the time I left, the roads were pretty quiet as everyone had already walked home. One day I noticed this man walking behind me. Not too close, but obviously following me. He was quite creepy. His face looked like it was made of plastic and he had a really subtle smile. Anyway, first time I saw him, I thought nothing of it. About two weeks later, I noticed him again, and from then on, I saw him every single day when I was walking home. I didn't tell anyone because I was 16, and I knew my parents would want to start taking me to and from school, and that's not cool. Anyway, one weekend, I was walking to my friend's house, which was a similar route to the one I would take to school. As I was turning up the main road that he would follow me back from school on, I happened to look over at a minibus that was parked at the bottom on the road, and I swear to God he was sat in the driver's seat, staring through the windows at me. I called my friend and made it very obvious that I was on the phone thinking it might deter him. But when I next turned around, he was about two meters behind me. With that same plasticky smile, I started to sort of walk, run, and I could actually hear him doing the same, keeping the same pace and distance the whole time. I was still on the phone to my friend, and I told her to open her front door and wait for me. When I got there, I ran straight in, and we locked up the door. The guy just stood outside her house for about two hours, smiling and staring in the window. After that, I never saw him again, and I've moved away since. But when I went back to visit my parents last weekend, the minibus is still there parked in the exact same spot. Count seven. Most recent disturbing event at half past midnight this past Saturday, I opened the door to let my dogs outside to go potty. As I'm standing there, this enormous rat runs through the door and into my foot. I started yelling, which awoke my boyfriend. We flushed it out of the living room, but now it's behind my stove. I can hear it rustling around. The weather was too crappy to go get traps, so I'm spending yet another night with a gigantic rat in my house. Account 8. To start... I just want to say that I've never been the type of person that gets caught up in the idea of paranormal activities or ghost stories. To me, even at a young age, those types of stories just seemed completely unbelievable, and I could never take them seriously. With that being said, what I'm about to post is something that happened to me a few years ago that pretty much changed all of that. It's not an overly scary story, but I think the simplicity of it is what creeped me out. As much as it did, my mom was in the real estate business, which often required her to check out houses on her own before taking costumers with her. She would usually just do this on her own, but every once in a while she would take me. Well, this house comes on the market that many other agents apparently say is haunted, and my mom figured she'd take me along. I'll be honest, the house was pretty creepy. 
completely covered in vines, but whatever. It's an old house, not really a big deal or out of the ordinary. We go in and look around the first floor, and for the most part, it seems like most houses she takes me to, still furnished, and has that smell of a house that's been empty for a while. The first thing that struck me as a little bit odd was that they had one of those old-style box TVs, and it was playing some old black-and-white World War II documentary, and it just made the house seem really old and gloomy. We eventually made our way upstairs to look at the bedrooms. The second floor was set up so that there was one long hallway with two or three doors staggered down its length. The first room was normal enough, but as we got to the second room, we saw it was completely full of stuffed animals. And not the toys, but a whole room dedicated to real stuffed animals, even though I thought that was pretty strange. The room was fine besides that, pretty neat and nothing out of place. And to get out of the room, we went down the hallway to check out the final bedroom, which again was fine. We're on our way to go downstairs. And for some reason, as we pass the second room, I look back in and immediately stop in my tracks because there was now a chair directly in the center of the room. We were both positive it wasn't there before since we would have literally walked into it when we were in the room before. But nonetheless, there it is, sitting directly in the middle of the room like it was meant to be there. Obviously, we got out of the house pretty quickly after seeing that. It was something so simple. But what really got me was that there was no explanation for it. We were the only two in the house, and neither of us went off on our own to check out a room without the other. So how the hell does a chair randomly move in? Arguably the weirdest room in the entire house. I'd consider myself a pretty logical person. And the fact that I can't think of a single explanation for what happened is why thinking about that house still bothers me so many years later. On a side note, in the few years after we looked at the house, it has sold five or six times, with almost all the homeowners saying that strange things would happen when they were in the house, like someone didn't want them living there. Account 9. When I was about four, my dad was a mechanic and found a little ugly chihuahua in a junkyard. He brought him home and my parents were going to take him to a shelter, but I begged and begged to keep him. I even swore I'd watch him since we lived in the middle of nowhere in the plains of the Panhandle in Texas. Anyway, they let me keep him. Mainly, I think, because they didn't think he'd survive. Fast forward five years, the dog grows up to be the most beautiful, big dog you ever saw named Ernie after Sesame Street. By this point, I was allowed to drive a golf cart to my grandparents' house about two miles away after school. The distance was pretty much just big field with a few fences one day. The battery went dead in the golf cart halfway there. Ernie had followed me like always, and we started walking the difference. All of a sudden, Ernie turns towards me and starts growling. This was a massive dog and I was terrified. i just seen Old Yeller too and was convinced that he had rabies. I tried to run past him and he jumped on me before I made two steps. He knocked me down. He stopped growling and just stood on top of me for a minute. When he got off, I started running towards my house. He just stayed there growling at something imaginary. I told my dad and he grabbed his gun, presumably to kill Ernie, and I was freaking out. Like an hour later, I heard a gunshot. Imagine my surprise when my dad and Ernie came back unharmed. Apparently, there had been a nest of huge rattlesnakes in the ditch ahead of me and Ernie had kept me from walking right through it. I had never noticed because I usually drove over the other side where the trail was. According to my very freaked out dad, there was no way I would have missed them. Ernie must have heard them and saved me. TLDR. I talked my parents into saving a chihuahua who turned into a big dog who saved my life from rattlesnakes. Account 10. This is a story that happened to my dad. Now my dad has never been one to make up a story like this before, and he can't even tell the story without getting goosebumps. It happened about six months ago, when my parents we on vacation at a friend's beach house. Out friends always told us about the place next door and that it has had five new owners over the three years they have owned the place. The last guy who lived there actually committed suicide about three weeks before this. But we don't know why. My parents just arrived there for the night. Everything is fine all day until they are getting ready for bed. My dad starts to smell gas. Turns out the pilot light went out, so he goes outside to turn the gas off. While he is outside, he said he started to get chills, 
and the entire time outside he felt nervous. Once he finds the shutoff, he hears someone say, What are you doing? The voice was so real and pronounced that he actually responded with, Shutting off the gas. He then realized what he just did and froze. Looked around and didn't see anyone. Thought it was my mother at first. But after freaking out and running inside, she was in the bathroom brushing her teeth. My dad couldn't sleep that night at all. They ended up driving home at 3 a.m. They told our friends, owners of the house, and they looked mortified. They told us the guy who committed suicide not too long ago did so by gassing himself in the house. My dad can't tell this story without getting goosebumps. I don't think I've ever seen my dad legitimately scared in his entire life. Could be a fake story. But the fear he gets in his eyes when he told me the story the first time, I don't think you can fake that. Account 11. About 25 years ago, I was driving to a friend's house and came up behind a car moving at about 15 miles per hour speed on a 40 miles per hour two-way road. I move into the opposite lane to pass and suddenly the guy speeds up and rams his car into mine, forcing me to the side of the road. That's the scary part. Here's the creepy, miraculous part. This happened on a Sunday in an industrial part of South Tucson, which is primarily Hispanic. When my car came to a stop after being forced over by raging motorist dude, there were two guys standing there ten feet from where I came to a stop. A pale redhead and an Asian. The motorist was exiting his car to come over and do God knows what to me or my car with an angry look on his face. He took a look at the two guys and got back in his car. I didn't stick around long, but I often think about those two guys just standing there doing nothing but looking out of place in an otherwise ghost town empty part of town and what might have transpired had they not been there i'm not a religious person but if there is an equivalent force to angels in this world i believe that was my brush with a couple of them account 12 this is a bit disturbing and creepy more than scary during my first semester of college my grandmother was diagnosed with terminal cancer i moved in with her and my grandfather to help take care of her she was given two months to live, but made it to nine before passing. Shortly after her death, I would be alone in the house and would see her walking through the hallways or would sense her sitting on a bed behind me in the computer room. It never freaked me, but did catch me off guard. Another time, in the same house, a girl I was dating stopped by and I went out into the garage to get something, and she was waiting for me in the laundry room that was next to the garage, I came in and we hugged for a moment when we both heard a dog running through the house. We could hear his feet, nails hitting the tile floor, and the sounds got closer and closer until we saw it round the corner and run directly between our legs and through the closed door and into the garage. We both just looked at each other in disbelief and then left. He dog was one that my grandparents owned many years before and that had passed away when I was two. I only remember it from pictures. Count 13. There was a local kid a few years back that would have dreams about a WW2 pilot that was shot down somewhere in the Pacific. In the dreams, he was the actual guy. Really weird stuff. He knew everything about the guy. The ship's name, the pilot's call sign, his best friends, his sister's names. He could even recall conversations that the dead pilot had with his buddies. I think 60 Minutes or something like that had a special on him and checked all the information the kid had about the pilot and it matched up perfectly. The kid had never read, watched anything about WW2 before. The kid's dad wrote a book about all this stuff, really interesting and creepy. Part 6. Account 1. I lived in a bizarre little house as a child. It was incredibly tall and thin, like an attached house except free, standing with three floors, a basement and an attic. It was full of quirks, such as two fully functional fireplaces, a shower stall in the center of the basement, a backyard so small that you could not take five paces without hitting the fence, and an old-time rope. Pulled dumbwaiter that led from the kitchen to my bedroom. I loved that weird little place. But unfortunately, it was incredibly old, and half of its charm was the fact that it seemed to have been designed by an inarticulate conclave of lunatics, and eventually the repair costs exceeded what my parents were willing to sink into it, and we had to move. Preparing for the move was a chore, 
I packed most of my stuff myself, and I had taken to throwing stuff down the dumbwaiter and shoving all my clothes so thickly in my closet that they became a single solid brick of fabric. While clearing that closet out, in fact, I came across a feature I hadn't noticed before, an attic entrance in the roof. Being an adventurous kid, I opened her up, stood on the clothes, brick, and began my first and last exploration into the topmost part of our weird little house. The first thing I noticed was that it wasn't as dark as it should have been. The place was strung with old red Christmas lights, which still burned with leftover incandescence, and a dozen little cracks and holes peeped down into all the bedrooms below. The second thing I noticed was that the place was set up for habitation. The insulation was plasticed away. There was an old gurney piled with sleeping bags and sheets, and a rusted mint, green refrigerator which still worked when I tested it. The third thing was the bones. There were a lot of bones. I was a kid at the time, with a limited understanding of anatomy, but there were bones of all types heaped into a series of piles around the center of the attic, small and large, clean and white, from every and any imaginable sort of creature, haphazardly stacked in a half-dozen osseous clumps. Two of them were blackened, as if someone had tried to burn them, and the walls nearest those blackened piles were scrawled in dark bone, char messages. Mostly, they were just smears, but the word, sorry, appeared more than once. That room had been sitting over my head for eight years while I slept. Account two. My grandpa made it very clear to all of us that if he wasn't going to make it to let him pass, he even said it the last time I saw him in the hospital. When the time came, my grandmother and mom and aunt and uncle weren't ready, so they allowed him to be intubated. I was so mad at them. They lied about the state of his health, claimed the doctor put off talking to them. It was all lies. I had just been through it. My daughter was born at 29 weeks and we knew something was wrong, but not what. We found out she had trisomy 18. She had been declining and there was no way she could make it through the night. The last thing I wanted was to let her go. But I couldn't let her suffer and I couldn't let her die alone in a incubator. I held her until she passed. It killed me to do, but I did it because I wanted to do right by her. The fact that my family was so selfish still makes me so angry. I didn't want to lose him either, but keeping him alive and extra weeks was not right. He died four months to the day of my daughter's funeral. It was a hard time. When it's someone's time to go, it's their time. Account 3. Back in late 2002, early 2003, I lived on an isolated road heading out to the middle of nowhere. A narrow road with no side streets, so houses after the first few miles and no street lights. Accidents were common since people loved to race down this road. One night I was home alone with the ex when we heard another car crashing. Only this one abounded weird like lots of cars wrecking. So we grab our shoes and run down to the road and there is literally debris everywhere. A pickup truck had taken the turn to hard and ejected all three passengers. The multiple crashes we heard was the truck crashing to the ground after each rotation. When we got to the road, the truck was all smashed up bit. Somehow its engine was revving and there was smoke everywhere as if it were on fire. All car parts and people were laying on the road. It was dark so it was really hard to see, but I could see the outlines of a man just sitting in the middle of the road making this horrible noise. His friend was lying there dead, so I don't know if he was screaming in pain or shock or what, but it's a sound you never forget. By that time, cops had shown up and used their spotlights on the scene, which made it worse. My mind won't recall a single image from that moment as weird as that sounds. I can remember the guy on the road, and though I can't see his friend, I know when all the spotlights go on the road is a mess, but that's all I remember seeing. What I know happened is when the guys were ejected, their bodies were torn apart. So much so that police were walking around with body beds after the victims had long since been driven off. I know the scene was so bloody that the road and the pull-off in front of our driveway was stained with blood for days. And the neighbor told me I calmly stepped over remains I noticed next to me when the lights went on but I don't recall any of it. The other thing I remember from that night is the life fight helicopter circling overhead and all the trees moving because it was so low. That alone is an eerie experience. Out of three men, two died on the screen. One lived and fled the country. 
They were migrant workers, probably my worst memory. Account 4. I was actually told by many of my older relatives that the saddest thing about suicidal deaths or whatever is that when the people die and they are discovered, they come back to haunt those who discovered them, or random people. During this process, they continuously try to convince those people to do the same and kill themselves to follow the dead, as I was told. Very freaky that this is happening to you and you're able to think almost nothing of it. My GF, as neighborhood had a string of suicides that were all unrelated. I actually believe what the elders told me to be somewhat true. Account 5. My uncle passed away from brain cancer, but my mom and I were kinda taking care of him through it. I was not yet a teenager, but saw the sadness in my mom when she was dealing with his dementia. He was really fucking rude to her and made me really uncomfortable. For instance, he would call her stupid for not stacking his papers right, flip out, then accuse her of stealing all his cups, so there was like 50-50 real insults and some just out of nowhere. They always had a good relationship, so it was also puzzling for me observing them together in good spirits a decade before. About a year after he died, we get home to find a few blinking messages on our tape answering machine, the mini-tape ones. We play it, and it's him. My uncle, first message was one we had heard before but we think not too much of it. The second one was one we hadn't. It was him apologizing to my mom, I recall. I shouldn't have said that earlier, so it had to have been after one of those times we left his house. Damn, it was so chilling. I tried to find some date correlation on why it would happen a year later rationally, supernaturally, but we simply don't know how. Account six, my most disturbing, scary, creepy story. There are a lot. One comes to mind. I was a sophomore in college, and some two friends, and I had heard rumors about an abandoned town in the foothills of the city I was in college at. We loved urban exploring and had already done some really neat stuff, so we figured why not. We packed our flashlights, black attire, and some water then headed out. It was about 11.30 at night when we arrived. Obviously you park far away from where you are exploring as to not raise suspicion, it was a bit of a walk down this dark and lonely road, but alas, we arrived at the gate. Now the entire town was fenced in, in the distance. You could just barely make out a couple buildings fading into the dark. They were small, it seemed. However, we had to find our way in. We had heard the way in was through a tiny hole cut out of a piece of the fence on the side of the hill. To find the path there, it's across from a red house. So we wandered around the area until we spotted a red house. We assumed it was the right one and started trailing ourselves up through thick brush, branches, trees. It was a lot of work to just get in. Finally, the way in. It looked as though someone had sawed through the iron fence. You're hanging onto branches or brush around you because if you let go, you'll fall all the way down the hill. We push ourselves through the hole in the fence, wipe the dirt off of our jeans and look up. An entire town, a market center, an apartment complex, houses, streets that branched off into little neighborhoods. We began to explore. We started towards the apartment complex, and what was that noise? It sounded like a beep. Did anyone else hear that? Beep? What is that noise? Beep? Well, let's keep walking. So into one of the apartment complexes we go. We searched around and found a mattress and some other random stuff. Okay, cool. But man... That subtle beeping keeps going off. All right, let's check out another apartment. We open the door to the next one. We open the door, and the main living room area was filled with black trench coats. Some hung up, some on the floor. We were stupidly curious, so we continued to explore that apartment. We walked upstairs, and one of the doors was completely locked. We didn't even try to force it open. We walked out a little freaked. We decided to move on and check out some other places. As we are walking outside, there are now multiple beeps coming from various locations of this part of the town. We began to realize as we walked closer to one building, a beep would grow faster and louder. We suddenly had this feeling as though we were being watched. What made us run out of that area fast was stumbling upon a decrepit old white house in the front yard was neatly piled shattered glass formed into square shapes leading up to the front door. We knew then something here was not right. 
as we stared at this and thought to ourselves whether or not we should check it out. A beam of light comes blaring at us through the top floor window and the beeps grow louder and faster. We ran straight across that town, as we are running bursts of light from various buildings light up and beam on us. It was like someone shining flashlights on you. You can see yours and your friend's shadows running as fast as you've ever run before in your life. My buddy falls, of course, but he is quick on his feet to recover. Together, we assume each knows the way out. Luckily, my buddy I was following had it right. I see the hole. My buddy climbs under and is out. I help my next buddy out. I didn't look back, but I could tell by the edge of the light bouncing up and down as I stood still helping my buddy slide through the hole that we were being chased. I crawl under the small hole, slide down the hill hitting some branches and scratching myself up pretty good. We run quickly down that old road. It seems so dark with all the lights in our eyes and so quiet. We see the car in the distance, the beeps fading in the background. We get in it and drive away. Three months later, we drove by the gate. It was torn down. We walked in and everything in the town had been demolished. There were some construction crews nearby and we asked them about the place. The construction man we talked to explained that it was a hot center for gangs, drugs, murders, all of that went down inside and it wasn't uncommon. The city had finally decided to just tear it down. Although that's not very scary or creepy, I figured it was good. I have more stories if you're at all curious. Thanks for reading. First story post on Reddit, TLDR, found abandoned town and was almost killed by a gang, I think. Account 7. I was in boarding school with my upper bunk bed right next to the window, and one night, I saw this man's silhouette. The head was large, the body was a little too skinny. Woke my mate up and we watched it walk away. Funny thing was, we were on the first floor and seemed like this man was at least 8.9 feet tall. Account 8. My friend's daughter is sick, very seriously ill. She has blood cancer. She is very smart and pretty girl, and very, very young. She is 19 years old. For me, this is most scary. Account 9. My mom and I were on a walk around the neighborhood when I was in high school. It was summer, and there were a ton of frogs making noise trying to mate. However, in front of one house, Hear what sound like a human screaming for help. It kept going, like a video playing the same three-second clip of a woman screaming over and over. We shrugged it off initially as he'd left the TV on, but we felt really weird about it for the rest of the walk. When we came back by the house, we could still hear the noise. Some of our other neighbors had the house key to this place. The owner was Old Widower and they went by from time to time to do housework stuff he had difficulty with. We went over there, told them what we heard, and that it seemed kind of weird but was nothing. They agreed to go check on him since they hadn't heard from him in a few days anyway. The poor old man died two weeks prior. The neighbor didn't hear any sounds besides the damn frogs. Still gives me the creeps to this day. Account 10 I don't know how creepy you'll find this, but I sure as hell got goosebumps like shit. I live in Norway, and it was winter at the time, so it was kinda creepily half dark. I was around 10 or 11, I think. I was walking to my friend for a visit, and to get to him, I had to pass over my schoolyard, no biggie. But as I got to the school grounds, I saw something that made me shit my pants. A fucking shitload of crows were plastered all over the school. Literally hundreds of them, just sitting there, no one else was around, needless to say. I walked around that time. Account 11. This is the story of O.M. In high school, I had a good friend named Steve. One day, freshman year 2007-ish, he told my group of friends about an odd turn of events that happened to his brother, Tim. A couple years prior, Tim went to college somewhere in New Hampshire, one night around 2 a.m., Tim and his good friend decided they needed Dunkin' Donuts, even though the nearest Dunkin' Donuts was across state lines. I don't know much about New Hampshire's geography, but I'm told this trek involved going through a narrow highway that takes them through some woods on the way back from Dunkin'. Donuts, a mysterious car pulled in front of them on the highway. It was a red compact car with the markings scratched off and its only defining feature was its license plate that had a black O and a green M who will henceforth be known just as O.M. 
Around this time, Tim describes weird coincidences happening, like his phone loosing service and the jazz station playing. Smells like teen spirit, but I'll admit it, those could have just been weird coincidences. At this time, Tim and his friend were sensing some bad juju from this guy. So Tim let his foot off the gas and was happy to just let Om go off on his way. But Om wasn't done with them. As soon as Tim slowed done, Om did the same. Tim thought this was weird, but maybe if he floors it, he could get around Om. But when Tim sped up, so did Om. Tim and Co. were freaking out at this point and had no idea what they were dealing with, but they saw a curve in the road up ahead. They saw OM go around it, and they decided to just stop. Their adrenaline was pumping and they weren't sure how long they sat there, but after what felt like 20 minutes, they worked up the courage to continue on their way. Maybe OM would have mercy on them, but as soon as they got around the corner, OM was there, the exact same distance as they last saw him. Matching their speed, OM clearly was without mercy. Tim and his friend were rightfully scared for their lives and relented to just going forward and hoping they could get out of this alive. Eventually, there was a fork in the highway. One led towards the college town while the other led further into the woods. Our heroes went home while Om ventured into the unknown. Tim never saw Om again. Epilogue 1. So I was told this story my freshman year and was convinced it didn't happen. And even my buddy Steve wasn't exactly sure of its veracity. But around 2008, 2009, I was listening to the local talk radio station while doing homework and heard a news bulletin. There was a murder in a neighboring county the previous night, and the sole witness saw a car leaving the scene of the crime. She described it as a red compact car with a license plate that had a black O and a green M. I nearly shit myself. I'm in suburban Orange County, California. What the fuck is OM doing all the way over here? Maybe I was just hearing things. I ran into Steve the next day at school, and he heard the same report. We learned two things. One, neither of were crazy. And two, that OM was fucking real. Epilogue 2. This previous May, my friend Blake was on his way home from dropping off his girlfriend around 2 a.m. For some reason, he decided to take a highway that leads through a canyon home. While driving along, a car pulls in front of him. It's a red compact car with a license plate that has a black O and green M. Blake was familiar with the stories and became rightfully scared and fell as far behind OM as OM let him. When they reached near the end of the canyon, OM did a U-turn and went back while Blake continued home to change his pants and sleep. Epilogue 3. This is not the first time I posted this story. In a previous thread, you Ravetti posted their own OM sighting. That is all I know about OM. I'm thoroughly convinced he's a cross-country serial killer who crosses state lines to confuse the police. But I admit it's only conjecture. Account 12. I was around 13 of uh, 14, and in my upstairs bathroom, being lazy, I decided to go in without turning the light on, since the room was dimly lit by the light in the hallway. From the bathroom, I can see the woods in the backyard kind of like a hill that went up into a sparsely populated second development behind mine. Anyway, I'm taking my glorious piss. When suddenly out the forest I see a light. Not a direct light, like somebody shining a flashlight facing away from me, like an indirect illumination. I look at it, and I'm thinking, the hell's this? It doesn't move. It just appears and is motionless. I kind of figure it might be a tracker light that was kicked on by movement and continue about my business. The light's still on, a good minute later and still facing away and I walk up to the window. It turns completely around, like a flashlight. It's a wide spread and slowly focuses and sharpens as it shines directly at me, and it's a good quarter mile away. It's a steady stream of light and it starts slowly moving towards the window and extremely bright. I can its reflection in the glass. But it doesn't light the room up. Just a bright light directly on me. To give you an idea, this is a third-story bathroom. With a good 40-foot drop to the ground and a hill that goes up alongside of it, a quarter mile away. And this thing came at the window like it was running on solid ground. I run to turn the lights on. The second I do, it disappears. And to this day, I still don't know what exactly it was. Part 7 Account 1. 
When I was about 13 years old, our dog ran away from home. This happened a few times, as the gate in the back was left open due to family members being careless and not ensuring it closed all the way, and she got out. Usually not a big deal. The neighborhood we were in was a pretty okay neighborhood, and I could usually find her not that far away sniffing at things. Usually in the alleys behind houses, as that's where people set out their trash, etc. She was just curious, and the minute she'd see me, she'd drop whatever she was after and come straight to me. We'd head home. No biggie. This one time it happened, though. I went looking for her and couldn't find her. I started to get a bad feeling and kept looking, probably a good six blocks away. Further than she'd ever roamed before was an area with a bunch of townhomes, rental properties. She'd never gone that far before, and I was nearly in tears, ready to give up and go home to wait for her to hopefully find her way back this time instead, as I'd been out probably for almost an hour trying to find her at this point, walking around. When I saw some slight movement behind a wooden fence and thought I heard a yip, in this random person's backyard was my dog, she was muddy and wet, and they'd chained her to a post in the yard. She was pulling at the chain, barking and trying to get to me. It was pretty far away, so I assumed that the people had decided to take her in, having seen her running around or something. I knew it was her, because she was my dog, damn it, and I knew it was her. And also she had her collar on. I'll never forget what happened next. I rang the doorbell. An older dude, Asian, opened the door after I rang the bell a second time having given it a good 20 seconds, and hearing people inside yelling, Talking yes, he said, looking at me through a crack in his door. Hi, my name is absolutely no shame, and I'm here about my dog. I'm so happy you found her and thank you for getting her off the streets. He looked at me suspiciously. What dog, he said, staring at me. What? My dog? The little white dog you have in your backyard, I replied. I was starting to get really creeped out at this point. We have no dog here, he said, and tried to close the door on me. That fucker. I stopped the door with my foot. The dog in your backyard, right there. I was getting louder at this point as I was starting to panic a little. I pointed towards his backyard and my dog started to bark frantically. He looked in the direction I was pointing looked back at me, sort of made a disappointed or annoyed grimace, and said, Oh, that dog, rather unconvincingly. Then he left the doorway. I was totally mystified and more than a little frightened at this point, so I went back around to the yard and was ready to climb over the fence and just take my dog back myself. When he came to the patio door of his yard, stepped into the yard with her, she cowered far, far away from him, I noticed, and unchained her from the post, then stepped over and opened his gate. She booked it to me and pretty much leaped into my arms as I kneeled down to meet her, and the old dude just wordlessly walked back inside with a scowl on his face. I have no idea what would have happened if I hadn't wandered out that far to find her, but he didn't seem to have any intention of returning her or calling the pound or anything. Her collar had her license tag, information on it as well as her owner's information on another tag, so his family could have dealt with it, but it didn't seem like they had any intention of doing so. I got the worst feeling from that guy. After that, if she ever got out of the yard again, she was never more than about 50 feet from the house, fence boundaries. We even found her waiting patiently outside the gate to the backyard. Once, TLDR, this guy had either rescued or stolen my dog, tried to deny it, was super shady, and I, I'll never know why. Account 2. When I was about 13 or 14, I lived on a farm in NC. This wasn't a regular farm that you would expect with fields full of beans and shit. It was actually a pine tree harvestery. Pine needles are a big landscaping commodity, and so we lived basically in the woods and would bale the pine straw every year, whatever. The point is, that my house was in the middle of 550 acres of perfectly lined longleaf pines. My living room had a huge picture window. I won't go into the architecture of the house, but it was a weird custom job built by some dentist in the 30 Ace S. The window in the living room stretched nearly the entire length of the room, maybe 50 feet. The house was built on a subtle hill, so the living room itself sat five or six feet off the ground. 
so you had something of an angle to look out at a solid mile of pine trees. During the winter, it was unsettling because you'd get just a bit of snow, enough to reflect moonlight, so that you could see the dogs running around at night. I'll be honest, I hated that room and that window. So now to the relevant part, I had a cousin over for the weekend, and we were doing what kids do in the country, throwing stuff in the fireplace to see what happens. It is getting late, and the fire is dying down, so we build the big kingdom of couch cushions and blankets in the living room and get ready for bed. Nothing out of the ordinary until we hear the dogs barking. They were really far away. The property stretches for nearly a mile, so I just assumed they were chasing off whatever animal felt like shitting in my yard. So my cousin is staring out the window and not saying anything, which prompts the standard. What's up? He just kind of keeps staring and says he feels like he's seeing things. Naturally, I get all anxious and start staring out the window as well. Nothing happens for a few minutes, and he gets more and more annoyed with me because I'm asking what he saw. He keeps shushing me so that he can focus. And then we both see it. A shadow of a person moves from one tree to the next. Not a run, not a leap, just a brisk walk from one tree to another. This is probably 100 yards out from the house. We can't actually tell if the person is coming closer or not because we're dealing with moonlight reflecting off of snow slush ice. I guess the crazy part is that we didn't so much freak out. Because at this point, there is still that chance that we didn't see what we saw, you know. So we just kept staring. We should have gone to wake up my dad, but he's an idiot and the kind of guy to walk out on the patio and holler into the woods with his rifle. We were just scared enough to agree that we don't want to taunt whatever is happening. So about three minutes later, it happens again. But a good 50 feet from where we first saw it, another person, another tree, a few strides, and they were gone. This happened every few minutes for the next half hour, and we just stared. At this point, I should mention that I didn't really have neighbors. The land surrounding our farm was federal paper. I don't know who owns it now, so it was miles and miles of uncultivated trees. You don't see people around the farm unless they intend to be there. So we keep watching as these two figures intermittently appear and vanish until finally we see one appear, but not disappear. Instead, we focus in on it and see that it is now running forward. We lose our shit and go wake my dad. By the time we get into the room with my half-awake father, there is no one to be seen. We sprint around locking doors and windows. Keep in mind that we're out in the country with no one around. It rarely occurs to lock doors. Every door was worse than the last, because you just know that as soon as you reach the door, someone is going to be trying to open it. Although that never happened. We locked everything up, walked around the house at least 50 times making sure no one got in without us knowing and then convinced my dad to fall asleep in the living room with us while we stared out the window. I never understood why my dad wouldn't call the police. He always had this, we take care of our own mentality, and it simply wasn't an option to call 911. The next day we went out to look, and absolutely, there were footprints everywhere in the snow. We saw them between trees, and then we finally saw where someone had been standing right in front of the window, but as I said, I wouldn't have seen them, because while I'm seven feet up in the living room, they would have been right beneath me. Account 3. I've told this story before, but this is an appropriate thread for it. One night, when I was 13 years old, I had gotten my period for the first time, and ended up sleeping on my back. I am an avid side sleeper, so this is a really weird position for me. I was dreaming, and in that dream I was sitting in a chair... I leaned it back on its back legs, and suddenly the chair started to slowly lean further and further back until I drifted into the eternity below me. This freaked me out, and I jolted awake. When I awoke, there was a figure leaning, hovering directly above my face, and all I saw was a hooded white, flat, ovular, and relatively featureless face with big, ovular, glassy eyes and an expression like it was determined to devour my eternal soul. The face was humanoid, very two-dimensional, with thin, quivering, angry lips and two holes where its nose would be, with eyebrows arched high up onto its forehead. I could feel an unworldly hate burning right through me as it loomed over me. 
It was absolutely the most helpless I have ever felt and would ever feel. Because it was more than just my life I felt was at stake. I tried to move, scream, breathe, anything and couldn't. It was paralyzing me with its hate. I finally was able to let out the tiniest whimper. And as soon as the sound escaped me, it stood straight up and paced back and forth at the foot of my bed, still staring. It was like a force field was erected around me, and the frustration of it trying to get at me again was radiating throughout the room. It looked like a starving tiger behind glass, longing to lunge at its vulnerable prey. If only it weren't for the barrier between us. It was tall, almost all the way to the ceiling. Tall and very thin, wearing a long black cloak that covered everything except that terrifying face. I realized that it hadn't been floating over me. It had stood at the foot of my bed and leaned over it to hover its face over mine. I sat up in my bed, still frozen, just staring at it. My closet door behind it was cracked a few inches, and it swooped in there and peered out at me, never having broken eye contact. It continued to stare, quivering with hate and frustration until it slowly faded away. I turned my light on, and it stayed on at night for a long time. I never slept with that closet door open again, and I didn't sleep again that night. I stayed the night in the living room with all of the lights on, just sitting on the couch. I later dismissed it as sleep paralysis for several years. It was a very believable and plausible explanation. Then I became friends with a girl who confided in me and told me a story. She was up late at night by herself with her door open. Something out in the living room by the kitchen caught her eye, and when she looked at it, she saw a figure standing there, beckoning her to approach it. She looked away, refocused on it, and it was still there. When she described it, she described the exact same creature that had attacked me. We each got a sketchbook and drew what we saw, and when she showed me hers, I was staring at my attacker all over again. She had never heard my story before telling hers, TLDR, was attacked by a scary figure one night, dismissed it as sleep paralysis until a friend described the exact same creature to me that had plagued her. She didn't know about my experience until after she had told me about hers. Account 4 I was at the Manassas battlefield this past April, with my BF at the time. We got so lost in the woods because we wandered off trail, and out of nowhere I heard a horse. I'd seen a group of kids on the horse tour thing earlier, so I thought they could help us get going in the right direction. But suddenly it sounded as if the horses were running full speed just out of sight. I jumped to the side to let them pass, and it went silent. I was bawling the entire two-hour walk back to the parking lot. Account 5 It was around last year. We had a friend that went missing for almost a week. We weren't really that close, and he lives in a campus dorm, so I really didn't know. Till that night. My housemates saw a report from the university's FB page that there were a couple of bodies found in a spring at the far edge of the campus. Our university is located beside a mountain. We all started to worry, especially when I learned that he really had been missing. We were anxious for news to come, and when the reports of the initial ID came in, we were shocked. He was one of them. The report misspelled his last name, but we knew it was him. Panic mode. My housemates and I went out to meet with his dorm mates. While I called a couple of our friends that went straight to the springs, they weren't able to see him there, since when they got there, the police already took the bodies for autopsy. At that point, we couldn't do anything but wait for further news. It turns out that the two of them went swimming there the weekend before and drowned. Their bodies got really bloated from being soaked for days and crustaceans started to eat away their skins. It really seemed at first that it was a frat initiation gone bad because they both looked like they were covered in lashes. It's a very fucked up way to die, R.I.P. Kevin. Account 6. I was running my cable route in the inner city between jobs I realized I had to shit. Now. Unfortunately, the nearest quick trip is like five miles away. Three hound 67 light years in city travel, so I gamble and hit the nearest gas station. I get there, and of course there's a line to the one unisex bathroom. A dude, a chick, and myself are hanging around making small talk. But mentally, I am an absolute shit-squeezing wreck. 
After about five minutes, the dude goes into full-on rage, panic, and starts trying to rip the door open, making the most demonic screeches. The woman in the bathroom is freaking out, the chick next to me is freaking out, and just as I step in to give him a WTFBRO, it was like he got hit with a jolt of electricity and fell. Luckily, I caught him, but at this point I realize he's having a seizure. I cannot describe the feeling I felt looking into this gentleman's eyes. Crying blood, foaming at the mouth, and flailing about that I was just having a conversation with. The elderly woman in the restroom happens to be a retired nurse. Go figure. And promptly instructs bystanders and I how to handle the situation, and the paramedics arrive towards the end of his fit. Turns out his alcoholism was linked with his epilepsy or some shit, and he was waiting in line to sneak a swig of the flask in his coat pocket. Info from his wife. Never would have expected it. Dude seemed cool as fuck. Well dressed and groomed all that jazz. The ordeal ends and I tell the woman it's her turn to use the restroom, to which she declines from being freaked the fuck out. I, however, dropped the most contemplated and beautiful deuce in the dirtiest bathroom of the metro area. Maybe it's not that scary, but seizures scare the brother-loving piss out of me. And I think some people's personal lives are too much for me. This is one of two insane instances where I happen to be in the right, wrong, place at the right time due to minor, unusual route delays. Count seven. My grandma was around seven and lived in Germany during WW2. Her town was getting bombed regularly. One day, her little brother kept crying and begged to stay in their neighbor's house for the night. Her parents were okay with it, and they went to stay with the neighbors. That night, a bombing run came through and their house was completely destroyed. It's crazy how close I was to not existing. Account 8. When I lived with my parents, I had come home after having spent the Saturday at a friend's. To my surprise, the house was quiet. My parents were supposed to be there, but no one responded when I said, Hello. I walk around and check the living room, the bedrooms, then decide to check the kitchen for a note or something, but instead, I find blood everywhere. It was clear that something very bad had happened, and I got this ill feeling. There was blood all over the sink, the countertop, the floors, just everywhere. So I go to grab the phone, but it too is covered in blood. As I stood there frozen in fear, staring at the blood-spattered wall by the phone, it dawns on me that whoever did this could still be in the house. My eyes then follow the blood down the wall to the floor, where I see it trailed toward the doors to the garage and the basement. I immediately dart out the front door screaming for help and see a cop car pull into the driveway following my mom's car. My mom jumps out of the car covered in blood and yells, We have to find Dad's finger. I soon somewhat find relief in discovering my parents are alive and well, and that my father had just lost his finger while using the chipper, shredder in the backyard. Along with the police, my mom and I looked through the wood chip pile for Dad's finger, but to no avail. So to this day, he has one less digit. The day after the accident, I was told to put the chipper, shred her away and move the pile, so I do, and end up finding Dad's finger. It was white and fleshy, almost fake looking. But it was real. I didn't want to touch it. So I picked it up with two sticks and brought it into my father, who cried at its belated discovery. We buried it in the backyard later that day next to our old dog. Account 9. I woke up to see my 75-year-old housekeeper sitting on a chair in my room facing me, staring, wearing an old WWW2 gas mask. I'm pretty sure it was sleep paralysis, though. Account 10. When I was about 10, 11, I was ill and did not go to school one day. My parents both worked and couldn't get the day off, so told me just to stay in the house and don't answer the door to anyone, and the usual stranger talks, etc. I was sitting watching TV in the front room that has a big bay window that looks out onto the street, which is a main road with a row of shops across the road. I felt awkward with all the people walking past, so decided to shut the curtains slightly and for some reason, as I did, I noticed this man in his late forties, early fifties with a beard and glasses, wearing a green knitted jumper. He looked like your stereotype child abductor. Something about him walking past just seemed strange, but not enough to play on my mind until he walked past again ten minutes later in the same direction, as if he had just looped around the block. Ten minutes later, he appeared again and stopped at the edge of the driveway for about thirty seconds, looking at the window, 
He then proceeded to the door, looking in the window as he walked by. It was an old Victorian sandstone house with big storm doors on the front that you needed a key to open, so he couldn't get in. He knocked the door a few times, but something just told me not to answer. He then came to the window banging it and saying something, but I couldn't make it out. I then noticed the realization in his face that there was a back door. My parents never locked the back door so the dog could come in and out as he pleased. I ran through to the kitchen and within seconds of turning the key and locking it, the handle started turning and he started banging the door. I just curled up in a ball on the floor in fear. He started trying to open windows and eventually left about 30 minings later. I dread to think what could have happened if I had not remembered the back door was unlocked. TLDR some guy tried to get into my house when I was home alone. Account 11. When I was a young child, I had the same dream every night for years about drowning when a huge wave swept over me and I sank to the bottom. Years later, I had a temp job delivering mail one summer during college. I saw this old lady sitting on a front porch waiting for me. When I got up there, she looked at me and said in a foreign accent, You drowned when Oceania sank beneath the waves. Freaked me out. Account 12. When I was a child, I lived in an old Victorian house, and I would always hear laughing while I was trying to sleep. I was an only child with a single mother, and when I was about five, six, I would wake up hearing laughter in the hallway in the middle of the night. After mentioning this to my mum, she swore it was probably just the TV being left on late. One night. I awoke hearing the laughter in my room. I went to sit up, but felt like there was someone holding my shoulders down, invisible hands gripping into my shoulders while I heard laughing. I screamed my little heart out. My mum ran into my room, flicking on the bedside lamp, convincing me it was just a dream until I said, but my shoulders hurt. She lifted up my t-shirt, and there were two adult-sized handprints on my shoulders. I honestly thought I had imagined it, and that it had never happened. But the other day, I mentioned it in passing to my mum, and she went blanket white and said, I don't want to remember that. Account 13. In 1993, I was lounging in the courtyard of TD Center in Toronto, laying on the grass, talking with a pretty girl. We hear a crash from above, and there was a man cartwheeling through the air, falling from a 24th floor window. I ran to see if I could help, and of course, that was pointless. He landed on the granite, was pretty mashed up. Apparently, he was at a party, and trying to demonstrate how one could throw their weight against the window and not go through.